these opening chapters, everybody's kind of in here in the same room at the same time, again, regardless of whatever your level of training is going to be, because the chapters are the same. So y'all, please help each other out. These early chapters aren't hard, right? However, they're going to, and they should, these chapters are really good for creating discussions. So if a question comes up, if you have a what if question, put it in the chat and everybody keep an eye on the chat, because if you see something that you want to chime in on, that's fantastic. Get some open discussions going while we're going through this. Um, if you, like I said, Chris, if it's getting really good and you want me to pause the lecture and, and kind of hop in and, and bring the lecture to match what the uh, discussion is, I absolutely will. So I'll be keeping an eye out for your hand for that. Um, I can't get into the chat. Uh, all right. So there are some people that are in here. Let me see. I'm going to I'm going to read your names again. Those of you that I say the name of, you are logged in under a guest account, which means that you can't see the chat. You must go through the SharePoint so that it forces you to log into your Aries email to access the um, the chat or to, to be able to get all of your features. Um, I only got a couple tonight. It's not too bad. We got Erica Guzman, Addison Morgan, possibly because your name doesn't say guest or have the uh, the way the same way that I've got it set up. Jocelyn Muniz and Kawan, um, that's just your first name, but Kawan Person, um, you guys are logged in as guests. So if you want, hop out of the class, go to the SharePoint and navigate your way to the class that way, because it'll make you log in and then you'll be able to have all of your access. Okay, I thought I'd come in through the SharePoint. Uh, you did. I'm not really tracking on why you, on why you um, don't have access. Don't have access. What do you got, come on? Okay, so I need to click on leave and yeah. So, yeah, so before you before you, before you leave the room, go ahead and bring go up the Aries website. website. Remember, you're going to go through the far sequence menu. Aries SharePoint. Aries SharePoint. So, so log out before you log out of here and then go that route. But it's going to make you log in. Go that route. But it's going to make you log in. Okay. So. And Tammy, I'm going to have to troubleshoot yours. I'll probably do it on a break and figure out what's going on. Uh, alternately, uh, Chris, if you want to take a shot at it, if it, I don't, I don't know. It's probably going to be something in the admin system that I got to go do. Um, because I see that you're still showing up under the phlebotomy tag, tag anyway. So that may be part of the issue. But I don't, I don't see why it would be. Robert, do you see me in the room? I see you on your camera. Okay. So then, so I'm on the live chat. So I'm on the live chat. Yeah, yeah, you're here. Yeah, um, yeah you're here. Um, okay. Okay. So, yeah, and I, I can see your name. Yeah, you're logged in, right? You're fine. So you can see the chat. Okay. Okay. If you, y'all will know that you're not we'll logged in properly because we'll all, all the stuff properly, I'm talking about in chat, you're not going to see anything chat related. Chat related on your stuff. On your stuff. Okay. So All right. I'm thank you. The, thank you. I'm on the Aries Solution, Aries Med Solutions dot com. Okay. Okay. So from there, so from there, what I'm going to need you to do is you log do, out of here. You have to leave here, here so that you so that you log back into, back into it. it. But go to the, menu, go to the menu at the top. At the top go to for students. For students. Mm -hmm. And then go to Aries SharePoint. And navigate okay, your way to the class, to through, the class there. through there. Okay, I'll leave now. All right. All right. And yeah, y'all don't forget to lower your hands. They don't go down automatically. You just click the raise hand button again. I think it changes to lower hand. That way, if Chris raises his, I can see it easier. Uh, 
um, while I wait for a person to come back in. Yeah, we're still working on the paramedic program. We're working on our own accreditation process, but it is long and tedious. So we are working with other colleges now. We're trying to see if we can get some partnerships that will boost things up faster. My goal is still to have the paramedic program up and running by July. Um, I haven't had any reason to have to move that back yet, but I don't want to say that that will happen until we start getting some MOUs in writing, because then I can actually say, yes, the date will start right here. Uh, when are the tests due? I'll let you answer that one, Chris. You know the, the policies on that. I have another question. With the paramedic program, um, how long is that program once we finish this? Paramedic typically takes about a year to get through. Uh, we're building a bridge program as well as the full one. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the length of the bridge has not been determined yet. I have to, I have to keep digging out curriculum and seeing how I could shorten it. It's okay, that's a process I'm definitely in itself as well. It. Okay. I'm gonna definitely do it. All right, Kiwan, um, you are still you came in as a guest again. Try the route one more time and look for an option to log in. Did you come through? Did you log in to um SharePoint? We'll probably just have to work with you all again after hours. All right, so I'll tell you what, um, and I'll I'll mention it again when we get to that toward the end of class, but I'm going to have you all stick around after. We're going to figure out what's going on. But to go ahead and move on with um, lecture, just because it's already 620, let's go in with this. All right, so I usually skip these first couple of chapters, or first couple of slides, rather. Um, they just tell you what you need to know. Now that you guys are able to look at all of your own slides, when if you want to pull them up from the SharePoint, you can. Some of these slides don't really have to be read. So chapter one, what we're going to discuss is mostly what EMS is, how do we fall into the chain of care from the time that an accident happens and 911 is called, all the way up until you have received your last treatment, your last dose of medication, and you are you know, way out of the hospital continuing back on with regular life. We are a small link in that chain, um, but it's a very important one, especially if you get injured in a place where you can't get yourself to the hospital. That's kind of our job in a nutshell, is to show up, stabilize, and then get you to the hospital if you need to go. That There's a lot more intricacies with that as you go up the levels of EMS. So like, for example, a paramedic has a much bigger toolbox. They still try to stabilize, but they can stabilize and start to provide some care in the field to maybe not make you have to go to the hospital for something that can be fixed in your living room. But for those of you that are EMRs, you guys know that your toolbox is very, very small, right? What you do is you show up, you stop the burning process. You, you know, try to try to stop the, uh, stop the bleed, stop it from getting worse. But that's about all you do. After that, if there's any kind of transport, typically you've got the EMTs and the paramedics coming on the ambulance because most EMRs don't work on an ambulance. I know that's kind of changed over the years, but that's pretty much where we are. Um, so when the system is fully staffed and, and functioning properly, you typically you see EMRs as non-transport medics or non-transport first responders. They are one step above basic first aid. And I don't mean that as an insult. I'm just saying that's when it comes to the scope of knowledge and, and scope of training, that's pretty much where they are. You're one step up from basic first aid. You show up, you provide your assessment, you can get vital signs, you build up some information for the people that are going to come and take them, but you're there to stabilize and do your assessment, and that's pretty much it. There's not a lot of medications that you give. Um, there's a couple, but even the stuff you do give, it's got to be the perfect situation for you to give it. Um, the next step up from that is your ENTs and your advanced ENTs and your paramedics, and we're going to, that's what we're going to get into. So we're talking about EMS as a system and how this works. All right, so the system contains a team of healthcare professionals that provide emergency care and transport. And again, um, 
this is governed by state laws and we didn't really talked about that we're going to get into that a lot when we get to chapter three because that's your ethics and your medical your legal stuff um but one of the things that i want to talk about here and the next couple of slides are going to kind of get into that but this one says it right here there's a difference between certification and licensure and i will say now as a preface to this even though i keep all of you on mute um you all have the ability to unmute because i'm going to ask questions that i would like some kind of feedback for that way i know you're still awake because this stuff is dry 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 um so that being said who can tell me out of the 45 people in this room minus chris what's the difference between a certification and a license so the certification is like um hey congratulations you've completed the class you have this um versus you know, let me turn on my camera real quick versus the licensure is the actual license for you to practice so it's Correct. completion of course versus the license to practice all right yes yeah. so at the end of this course you guys are going to get a completion certificate and then you're going to be able to test for the registry and when you pass the registry congratulations you have a certification and that certification says that you have gone to training and you have met a standard of knowledge that says that you can do this these skills it doesn't say that you have permission to do these skills it just says that you meet a standard that you should be competent to do these should you be allowed to um anybody can get a certification all right and, and i say that as a firefighter you know we're a very certification driven career field but just yeah, because yeah. you have officer one doesn't mean you're going to be a good officer right there's a lot that goes into that and it's the same thing with this a certification just says hey you were taught a skill you have proven that you can do said skill that's all that means so what happens is once you get your certification to actually work as an emt or an advanced emt or whatever you have to get a license the license is what allows you to actually practice and that comes from your state so the certification is a step in a lot of states now all these Pretty much every state is what we consider a national registry state. Even the, the last big holdout was New York, and they're in the process of uh, changing that now, finally. So um, those of you that are New York students, y'all are going to be able to get your license from this class as well. Uh, a couple years ago, that was not the case. So welcome aboard. Um, once you get your certification, you go through what's called you go through your, your state's uh, licensing program and every state does it different because they all have their own way of doing it. And once you get your license, now you just have to maintain it. So every two years you're gonna renew and hopefully you don't like shoot anybody or set a building on fire or I don't know, steal more than $500. A bad check over 500 is considered a felony as well. But don't do anything dumb and you'll be able to maintain your license and everything. And I highly recommend because y'all are going to see when you take these tests, once you get your license, do not let it lapse. To go back through the registry again is you must just like punishing yourself is all I can say because these tests are not easy. Um, they're, they're accomplishments. When you pass the registry, you can, hey, and if you're a first attempt passer, that's almost bragging rights because not a lot of people, I think nationwide, you're looking at something like 40% of the country that takes the test passes it on the first attempt. It's not a high number. The test is the test is very hard. Uh, for those of you that are taking the EMT test, every question you get right, the next one's harder. So no matter how much of a hot shot you are as an as you know an EMT student, that test is going to humble you. Um, it's it's hard. It's very very hard. Advanced EMT students, you guys get a little bit easier deal. Y'all have to pass. You have to take X amount of questions. I forget what it is. It's like 120 or 125 questions. And it's a static test. You get the same questions every time you take the test um, or the same amount of questions. I'm sorry, it's, the test ranks bigger than that. But you whatever the amount of questions is, you know it from question one. It says one of however many it is and they're preloaded. So um, they're not the test is not going to get it's not going to rise to your education level. So in a sense, that's good or it could be bad because people fail the advanced EMT as well. But um, the EMT basic one, that's that's the doozy. Will the All test right. shut off if you hit so many that you got correct? Yes. Um, Kind of. So for the EMT basic one, 
you're going to cut off anywhere from like, I think 70 questions is the minimum up to something like 120. And if anybody that's in advanced EMT, if y'all recently became an EMT and you know that answer better than me, you can buy, feel free to chime in. If you're going to, if the test winds up being short though, I do know this, you either did really, really good or you did really, really bad. Because what's going to happen is, is as soon as the test determines that you've, you're going to pass, then it's just going to pass you. Or if it's like, wow, you really need to go back and study, it's just going to cut you off at the minimum because there's no sense in giving you those last few questions. You're too far one way or the other. If you were to miss everything after that, you probably still would not pass or you still would not fail and it'll just go ahead and cut you off. Um, so when I people, took, when I took National Registry last year to research, because I needed it when I came back, when I came out to Louisiana, it shut me off at 70 questions and I passed. Yes. When I took National Registry 10 years ago to get my initial EMT, it cut me off at 115 questions and I still passed. Okay. So what's happening there when the test draws out like that, there's a section and you see that more, you're right. So your first time going through, you're more likely to have more questions because usually it's childbirth. Um, there's a section, at least one section that the test is like, oh, you're riding that line, you know, maybe maybe a couple more questions and we'll get to, we'll get you off of it one way or the other where you're, okay, now yeah, you're going to pass it or, oh, now you're missing more. Maybe you should study. Um, so early on, you you may have more questions because there's some topic, there's, there's X amount of, I think it's like five topics on the registry, five lanes, and you have to pass every single one of them. The questions are all jumbled up. But um, early on, you may be struggling with one. And you'll know it too, because a lot of people will come out of the registry like, man, I got a whole lot of trauma. Most of my test was trauma. Most of my test was OB. I, I kept getting like, I'm really going to be an expert in childbirth. Um, what's happening is, is that was probably the topic you were struggling with. And so the registry was feeding you more questions to make you either get further to the passing side or further to the failing side before it made a decision. Um, those people that tend to refresh with the registry find this a lot easier and a lot shorter of a test because you know more, you're more confident with your, your knowledge. Um, but those first, first times when you're first trying to get your certification, um, don't let it discourage you. If you have to take the test more than once that just, it's, it's not a high pass rate. Okay. Anyway. So most states have four training and licensure levels, EMR, EMT, advanced EMT, and paramedics. Some states are still a little funny, even though they're national registry states. A good example is Alaska. I was talking with a uh, friend of mine this afternoon who worked up there and theirs is, theirs is weird. So they have EMT basic, but that's not really basic. That's actually EMR. Then they have EMT one, two, and three. Um, one is like the old EMT I-88, if um, y'all are old enough to remember those levels. EMT two is a mix of the nine, not eight, um, was it 95, 99, something like that. Um, there's two levels of intermediate that used to be out there. Their EMT two is a mix of that and an advanced, uh, modern day advanced. Um, and then EMT three was, that's their paramedic. Um, so they're, they're a funny state. So we can't say all 50 states follow this model, even though they're all national registry states. But these are the levels that you mostly are going to see unless you do go out somewhere funny like Alaska. So again, EMR, a lot of times you'll see those on fire departments. Uh, some some progressive police departments will run EMRs. Like, they'll make all their all their cops EMRs. Um, but the idea is that that's good non-transport and it's, it's cheap, easy. You get the training pretty quick and you can start making a difference on scenes. Those are phenomenal trainings for um, avenues of public safety that don't really incorporate EMS all the way. They're also really good for uh, like lifeguards can get it. Um, anybody, uh, you see a lot of EMRs in the industry. So if you guys don't want to work on an ambulance and you, maybe the fire department is not your thing, start looking into industry because a lot of them have um, their own medical response. And Chris himself, as a paramedic, he works more like a doctor. Uh, he can tell you more about that when he gets his voice back. But um, he runs the show on his offshore rig. I mean, he's it. He's the doc. So if he can't fix you, they have to helicopter you off to an actual doctor. Um, EMT and advanced EMT, the real big difference is there. And I know these are upcoming slides, but I'll say it now and then we'll skip some slides. 
EMT is still considered VLS. AEMT is kind of a hybrid. So EMTs are not really built to do anything invasive. And Mississippi took that very seriously for a long time to the point where we couldn't even check blood sugar because mm -hmm. pricking the finger meant we were invading a, a route that was not a normal way in. So EMTs don't do IVs, for example. EMTs in Mississippi up until recently couldn't even stick a finger. Uh, that has thankfully changed. They've kind of caught up a little bit. But um, the idea there is that the EMT has all the, the stabilization skills of an EMR with a little bit more of an expanded medical toolbox and some more clinical skills. Um, advanced EMT, you all get a lot of the skills of the paramedic, but not the clinical knowledge. So, for example, you'll be able to do IVs by the end of this class, those of you that are in advanced. Um, you'll be able to give certain drugs like lidocaine. Narcan can be given IV, which is not normally, and and, and you can do nasal spraying as well, but uh, you'll be able to give it in more routes. You'll be able to give nitro in more routes because we're trusting you with a bigger toolkit. Paramedics, paragods, whatever you want to call them, um, they pretty much can do everything that a doctor will allow them to do. And in some places are very, very progressive with that. Um, I don't know, Chris, if you've ever worked in an area that allowed you to do pericardiocentesis, um, but that's a scary intervention. I, I don't want to be, I think I would actually say, you know what? No, I'm, I'm not going to work here because I don't want to have to do that to somebody one day. What if I miss and just literally stab them in the heart or something like that? So, um, some things can be some places like Virginia and Maryland can be very progressive because they do that up there in the field, stab you with a needle, start sucking fluid out from around your heart. I don't want that on me, not in the field, not without something to look and make sure I'm going in the right spot. Um, I'll stick to doing needle decompressions. Those are easier. But um, they get to do a lot. Now, on the trauma side of the house, it's hard to distinguish what any of these levels um, dividing areas are. Trauma's trauma is fixed in an ER in a surgery room. Surgery fixes trauma. So in an EMS setting, the trauma interventions that a paramedic can do, the EMR can do 99% of the same stuff. When it comes to trauma, and that's why when you get into this field, trauma's fun for a little while, then you realize it's actually kind of boring because it's always the same thing. And no, no matter where you go in your levels of training, it's always the same thing. Uh, the only difference in my trauma assessment for paramedic than it was in the, pre, in the lower levels was two large bore IVs, and that was it. Um, so trauma is is the same. When we get to the trauma chapters, you guys should, especially if you've been through this kind of training before, it's just expanded knowledge, but it's all the same stuff. The basics are the same. All right, so yeah, we get to go through all these. The EMR is here is very basic training, blah, blah, blah. You may assist the ambulance, but typically you're not going to work on the ambulance unless you're in an austere environment or somewhere where they just don't have enough EMTs or paramedics to staff it. EMTs are basic life support. You get to do a little bit more, uh, like more airway adjuncts. Advanced EMTs, IVs are like your candy. That's your, your big claim to fame. Um, and you can administer a limited number of medications, but you can't do full ACLS drugs or anything of that matter. Um, just because that they got to leave something for the paramedics. So, um, but even that has changed because of the paramedic shortage. There are some areas of the country that are allowing AEMTs to do way more than they used to do. And it's making the need for paramedics start to come down to match the amount of paramedics we've got. Um, I'm kind of curious to see where that's going to level off because I'm afraid they're going to get to a point where they, who wants to go to paramedic school for almost two years when it's all said and done just to be able to do an ET tube and let that be it. Okay. Um, Debbie, do you want to say something out loud? I have a question. The The slides that you skipped Will that be in the lot in the video on the way back? Like when I look at it again. So all the slides are available for download in the SharePoint. If you go to any chapter and okay. click on the additional resources, you can get the whole slide. So, so what I'm skipping is just slides okay. that I've already talked about. But if you want to get them and go back and see what okay. they say, all of that's there. Okay. All right. Thank all right. you. Absolutely. Wow. All right. Moving on. All right, EMTs are the back. Oh, by the way, guys, those of you that are in the advanced EMT class, I am using the EMT slides um, because it's the same information. When you start getting into things that are more strictly advanced EMT, 
they're going to look a little different. It'll be geared toward you, but all of this is the same. EMTs are the backbone of the EMS system in the United States. They provide care to the sick and injured. That's why your textbook is called what it is. Um, and the requirements do change from state to state. So some of your more uh, progressive states tend to be up in the either the northeast um, around D.C. particularly. It's kind of wild how much stuff they can do. But really, the more you the more stuff you uh, do is going to be in those austere environments. The requirements also change. So we exist, Aries exists in multiple states. And what we do to do that is that we adopt the most stringent um, requirements that there that there are so that we can just, everybody does it. Now, because of that, and we have students from different states. So some of you may have done more to get into this class than you did to get into another class in regards to this. Some schools require a high school diploma. We don't. Uh, we have high schoolers in the class. So we, if I required a diploma, then none of them would be here. Um, proof of immunizations, that's usually a clinical thing. So that's not really the school. Like we don't we don't dictate what uh, vaccines you need. All right. So I know that there's some hot topic ones out there. We don't have rules about what you need. However, the ambulance company that you're going to ride with might, like Acadian, requires COVID-19 vaccines um, for all students even though they don't require it from their employees. It's just something that, that when they when they put it in place and they took it away, uh, the school held on to it. Um, that being said, you Jackson County people, um, y'all are exempt. You think you're, you're chiefs for that one. Uh, they are very good at what they do. Um, successful completion of a background check. Pretty much every state does require at least a basic federal background check. So we've got that built in. Most of you have done it, but again, um, that's not the reason why I say that is because like we at the school, we don't require it. It's to start your clinicals. So here we are on night two, technically. If you don't have your background check started or done yet, that's okay. You're not kicked out of the class. However, you can't do your ride-alongs and you can't get your license until that is done. Those are state rules. So you can get started with this, but don't don't forget to get that done because you're going to start that you will hit some roadblocks if you don't eventually get to it. And then a valid driver's license. Why do you need a license to work in EMS? Because you drive an ambulance. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure they would uh, frown on you doing that without a license. So right. is it SIBO? Uh, so with SIBO, is SIBO good enough or do you have to have a Class D license? Chauffeur's no, so license. OK, no, 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 no. Well, not unless your state requires it. And, and so far, the states that we're in that we can take students from don't require that. Um, a regular, a regular I license. I had to take the SIBO. So, all right. OK. You're, you're talking about EVOC, EVOC training and stuff like that. Now, that's different. That's an agency thing. So um, fire departments may require it and everything, but that's at the departmental level. That's not a state thing. So these, these slides are written by the uh, NISTA, National Highway and Traffic Safety Association, and DOT, which means that you're getting this information from the state level at the lowest. Um, Mr. Rob, if you ever go to, if you ever get into Missouri, uh, they do require a Class E chauffeur's license there. For just a hospital or uh, for an ambulance EMT? Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh wow. Well, that's good to know. That's where I first certified was in 2002, and they required it then. You had to go through okay. and take another written exam for it. Well, the good thing is, is that doesn't change our program. That's because that won't be a thing until you're certified and trying to find work. But that's good to know. So when we get Missouri students, I'll make sure they know that, yeah, they do have some some more requirements. Um, all right. So license requirements, you have to, A, you have to complete this course. Now I have a, a roadmap that's gonna help you guys out, especially the EMT students that are going through this for the first time. Advanced EMT, it's not really your first rodeo, right? You had to go through all the stuff with the NREMT website to set up for your psychomotor and your um, your registry test and all that stuff. But some of you, this is your first time doing this. So that being said, um, I'm going to strangle Rodney. You can tell him I said that, uh, Tim. But um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of steps you have to do. First, you have to complete the course. Once the course is done, 
then you go to do your psychomotor skills testing. So EMT students, we can do your psychomotor ourselves. Unless you're a Louisiana student, you have to go to Baton Rouge. Um, advanced EMT students, y'all, the schools can't do it. All right, and but y'all are also in a funny spot. I don't know if y'all have been keeping up with the news, but after June 30th, once July 1st rolls around, y'all don't have to do psychomotor anymore. The AEMT and the paramedic psychomotor skills are going away and the registry is being revamped to have all that stuff put into the test. Because the idea is that you did your skills as a to get your EMT and you have to have EMT to get into advanced EMT. So there's no sense in making you do advanced or basic skills all over again. You were already signed off by competent people who said, yes, you know what you're doing. So why make, why reinvent the wheel? So they took all that stuff out and then they looked at what was left and they're like, well, we can just ask them questions about this. Like, um, Static and dynamic cardiology. You can easily, with technology, make a test, and those tests are all digital. Just put all that stuff into the test. Um, so that's what they're doing. So if you, when y'all finish this course, um, in all likelihood, like all right, so the last lecture is April 27th. Um, that's May and June that y'all can be finishing up your clinicals. And then what I would do, if it were just me, to not have to rush it, I would wait for July 1st and then just go take the registry for the advanced EMT students. It'll be easier for you. You're also within the three month time frame because the class doesn't, it, the last lecture ends on April 27th. That's right now. We have flex days built into it. So if, you know, Chris and Patricia are sick, if I was still out with the military, I wouldn't be able to be teaching. Um, so there may be nights where we cancel class. Um, and so we had that, that flexibility built in. But if everything goes according to plan and we don't miss a single day and there's no holiday um, interaction that we have to worry about, April 27th will be the day. Uh, I digress. But yeah, just some advice for y'all. Advanced EMT students, I would wait until July to take your test. That way you can just do the registry test and be done. Uh, EMT students, y'all y'all are still having to prove yourselves, basically. So you will have skills. Those, those are not going away. All right, a couple of other requirements, um, and some of this is more on us than y'all, but it's good for you to know about it because if any of us break the rules on this, uh, the hammers come down pretty hard if you if it needs to. So ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, this prohibits employers and schools or anybody for that matter, in a professional sense, from failing to provide full and equal employment or access to things like um, the training. We've had students that have come through that have had documented learning disabilities that we've had to make adjustments for. Not a big deal. Um, this act ensures that us or any other school doesn't say, nope, sorry, we don't want to deal with you. Can't do that. Um, employers can't discriminate against you on the basis of sex, religion. Y'all have heard all this stuff before, right? So that's what this is. This protects you, but it's not just your employer. It's everybody. So you, us as a school, we're providing you a service but it's a service that brings you into the workforce. So we have to follow the same rules. All right, some origins of, of EMS, not quite as old as the fire service. The oldest fire department um, in history, I believe was the Roman times. We don't go back that far. Uh, EMS started around World War I in the way that we see it today. It started off with ambulances around that time. As most things come from war, I, as much as I hate to say it, you know, being in the military, I'm, I'm a firefighter and medic. Um, I don't exactly itch to go to war. I'm not kicking in doors and stuff like that. But um, we get a lot from it. The microwave came from uh, war. Actually, I think it also came from one of the world wars. Space travel, um, styrofoam, um, x-rays, tourniquets, um, quick clot. I could go on for a while and name a bunch of stuff that we use that was developed on or for the battlefield, because that's where most of your trauma happens, um, that we've adopted into the civilian world. So pretty cool that EMS as a whole also adopted from war, because that's where we needed it the most, right? Somebody's, if I just grabbed somebody and drug them off the battlefield and did nothing for them, between where they got shot and where the nearest healthcare facility was, usually they were dead. That's why a lot of times prior to that, they just left them. And then you, you've seen it in some movies. They just come by after the wars over and somebody's still alive. They just put them out of their misery. 
um, there's a better way. So we have EMS. And in the old days, it wouldn't be exactly like what you expected it to be. Back in the 60s and 70s, anybody ever see an ambulance from that time and know what it was? I'm going to take a guess as to what an ambulance was from the 60s and 70s. It doubled as something else. It was else. a hearse. It was a hearse. A hearse. It, uh, it was interesting because, I, I mean, it's it practical, right? If they're taking you and you die on the way, you're already in the hearse. Um, it's a little morbid. But, yeah, that's where we started off with. And ambulances have kind of gotten away from that. But um, that was it. So a couple of big things. Um there's another saying that kind of makes a lot of sense, and we see it in the fire service, is that change comes about one funeral at a time. Some of y'all there in the fire service, you've probably heard that. A lot of safety regulations come because somebody's been killed, and we need to have better equipment. So the safety ratings on your rope and rigging equipment, they are what they are because people have broken the rope and fallen to their deaths, and they need to be like, all right, it's not hard to put a, a, a standard on a manufacturer that says, hey, this needs to be tested to hold 9,000 pounds or, you know, depending on whatever your equipment is. Same thing in the EMS world. So these are a couple of landmark things that have happened over the years to kind of develop EMS as to where it is. 66, you had this book or not really a book. It was a um, article that was written. It's called Accidental Death and Disability, the Neglected Disease of Modern Society. That's what established EMS. That was the the big eye opener that said, hey, we need to do something about this. Um, and it made more sense than the doctors going out and doing house visits, which is what a lot of times would happen before the house calls, right? Because you have one doctor having to go to everybody's house and without a staff, it was just them. Um, they could only do so much. So it made more sense to have now the hospitals became the central locations and we had EMS bring people to them. Um, DOT published the first EMT training curriculum in the 70s, and I want to say that was actually Nancy Caroline's was the first book. Could be wrong on that one, but I'm, I, I heard that somewhere. So the paramedic book uh, that we use is going to, is, I'm pretty sure that was the original. Then you get the EMS Act in 73, and they've updated that a lot over the years. Um, and then AAOS published the first EMT textbook in 1971 and that's who your book is now if if you're using the one that we recommend the emergency care and transportation of the sick and injured that's aaos it's the american academy of orthopedic surgeons and it's like aries it's a mouthful we just stick with the logo, uh the acronym all right national national standardization efforts uh the 70s 80s and 90s had a lot of it you notice that these are all um federal things right that are dictating this but if you think about it like i was saying a couple of slides back most of everything is regulated in by e in ems by the states and if you think and another question other than the fire department can anybody think of anything federal that operates ems or or okay. even state matter for that for that matter any any um no oh, say it this way the average Ambulance service. Is that a private company or a public company? Acadian, AMR, GMR. Those are all private. They're all private. I want to say, I'm, again, I'm, I'm thinking it was in the 90s. Um, Y'all are welcome to research that. You can definitely tell me I'm wrong if I'm wrong, but I think that was about when they did it. They privatized EMS because the way that they had it set up prior, it wasn't, um, it wasn't cost effective. The government was trying to save money, and they're like, we are losing our tails off on affording this service we're gonna let it be privatized that way we can let the pri you know the free market handle it and all that stuff for better or worse because those of you that work for ambulance companies know you don't make much money right um the best money is still and the best quality of life is still in the fire service uh i say that maybe a little bit biased but it doesn't make me wrong um i like being able to get up go on a call and hand the patient off and then go back to my recliner. Um, and I get, you know, fire departments get state retirement. They get better pay typically. Um, it's not it's not a bad gig. So if you're if you want to do 911, I will always talk up the fire service. And I'm not really trying to say don't go work for a private ambulance company, but I'm trying to say. Look at what you're signing on for. 
different name. Not all ambulance companies pay the same. AMR out here, one of the best paid in the area. Um, there's plenty of complaints, but there's plenty of complaints about anybody. So um, make your own decisions on that. Some ambulance companies are better, some are worse, and it really just depends on what it is that's important to you. So, because you may not care. Like one ambulance may be deficient in something to, in one person's eyes, and then to another person, they're like, well, that doesn't bother me. So they're perfectly happy. Let me go. I back. know for us, we're strictly 911. Uh, yeah. And that's, yeah and, that, and that's another thing. Some people hate doing the IFTs, the interfacility transfers, because they're not 911. There's no trauma involved. There's no lights and sirens to the side of the road or anything like that. So sometimes that's the complaint that somebody has about an ambulance. It may be, they may be gold to work for, like uh, AMED. I all know who AMED is, but they do um, interfacility transfers, and they only really do 911 if the 911 system's overloaded. So uh, I've I've had a lot of people tell me that they don't like working for AMED. Nothing to do with AMED. They just didn't like not running 911. And then you've got people that are the other way around. They're like, man, I've been in this for 20 years. I'm sick of getting woke up at 2 a.m. So they'll, they, you know, they want to go work for AMED. So that way they don't have to go dig somebody out of a ditch at three in the morning. Um, I will I say. Definitely understand where they're coming from with that. Yeah, I will say, pro you know, being an EMT for 10 years, that I probably got my best experience starting off in IFT because you get to spend more time with the patient and really get to do your vital signs and get to know the history and things like that. So yeah. I've always been an advocate for working IFT first before going 911. It's good because it helps to build up your compassion too, right? You're you're dealing with people who are, um, they're stable. So you're going to talk to them if they're awake and stuff like that. And it's really it, that emergency factor is not there. It's hard. It's sometimes a little bit harder to connect to your patient and, and talk to them when they're just an unconscious body on the ground. So it helps I get, get your bedside manner and yep. your critical thinking in. Absolutely. Especially if they are a little bit unstable. All right. So I have a, a hand raised and then we're going to take a break because it's almost seven o'clock. Um, who is this? Timothy, go ahead. I was just going to say, so I, uh, I'm a EMR on a basic truck and we run a lot of transfers, some okay. of them long distance. Um, but the plus to that is our ALS truck also runs transfers as well. So when they're out of county, we get to take all the 911s. So, I mean, st starting out as an EMR on a basic truck has been beneficial for sure. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Now, any experience is good experience even if it's a bad call because hopefully you come out the other side of it right and and there's things to help with that we'll talk about in the next chapter actually critical incident stress management and all that um you're not superhuman and and we're going to talk more about that so you got to find ways to stay good so even in ifts and, and getting this early experience if you see something tough you know maybe you're carrying somebody that just lost a leg uh, we saw a lot of that, like battlefield injuries and everything. I was a flight medic for a while in the Air Force, and we were long distance fixed wing flight, taking care of patients crossing oceans and um, hemispheres and stuff like that. You really a lot of a lot of bedside manner does get built up from that, uh, and it really gives you a good perspective of what people can go through. Um, right. Now, I will say. You know, sometimes it does get exhausting because we'll, we'll get woke up at two in the morning to run a four hour transfer, you know, there and back. So that's one of the downsides to it. But yeah, I just I always hated it when they would come in like five minutes before shift change. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? That's eight hours. That's to be time for me to clock back in by the time I get back from this. Um, but anyway. I can agree with I can agree with him. <laughs> the last two mornings we've had calls at two three and four o'clock in the morning and it's it's a two hour run by the time you yeah, pick up not. the patient from where we're located to get to the hospital and go back to your station it's almost two hours all right it is seven o'clock uh my time eight o'clock for those of you on the east coast you time travelers um let's take a 10 minute break be back 10 after and we're going to pick back up where we left off and then before all of you bounce out, well, not all of you, but let's see, who was it? Um, Lewis Carpenter. I see your question and, and 
Chris texted me about it. Um, then we are on break. If y'all y'all don't have to stick around to hear this, I'm just putting this out there because it was a question. Uh, our background checks are done through state police. Uh, for Louisiana, you have to do it through state police. Now, we do have a company we can recommend you to if you're in another state and they don't care. But it's just as easy to run by e any state, your own state police, and say, hey, I need a basic federal background check. You don't need uh, fingerprints. That's that's usually a sticking point. People think they have to get the fingerprints, and they're, sometimes it's hard to find that. But um, your state police can do it for you. Just basic federal they make sure there's no felony warrants out for your arrest or, there, or convictions, and then you're good to go. Uh, Louisiana, y'all have to go through your state police. That's that's state policy. Breaks over at 10 after, so you've got, by my clock, 10 minutes. So, Mr. the Louisiana, um, I went through our background check. Um, I called our office and they also they told me that I do not have to go to state police no more. It is through a third party company called Identigo. In Louisiana? There's different little locations that do that process. Yes, in Louisiana. That oh, was uh, from Ms. at their office. I made a phone call last week. And uh, I actually had to schedule mine for Friday. Uh, there's different little locations throughout the state that has the little identical service that does the fingerprints and all that stuff. I guess uh, state police got tired of trying to handle everybody because it's that's a nightmare. If you think about it, you have to be you have to anytime you make a change in your uh, licensure, you have to get. Well, let me rephrase it. You get a license, you have to have a background check. You renew your license, you have to have a background check. You change your license, you have to have a background check. So they're not just keeping up with every new person coming into the system. It's everybody that's there that has to refresh or goes to school or anything like that, and everybody else coming into the system. So yeah, I don't doubt, because I know it got it got real bad at State Police. When um, the previous student of ours that has actually done some work with us, her name's Donna Travis, she actually came to us and got her EMT. Then she came to us and got her advanced EMT. Then she started helping us actually run the programs. Then she went to paramedic, uh, but we don't have the paramedic program up. So she went to school of EMS for that. Um, they were making her go and do her background check in Louisiana every single time. And she said it was just obscene, They're like lines out the door. You couldn't tell who was in line for a background check and who was in line to get arrested. It was, it was just too much stuff going on. It overwhelmed state police. So I don't doubt at all that they finally made that made that adjustment. I just did not know that. So that's called Identigo because I need to change our regulations on it. Yes, it's uh, Identigo and you can also find it on um, our um, Bureau of EMS website. It's on their uh, on their main screen. Okay. Under awesome. the Louisiana Bureau. Yes, underneath the LAB EMS. There. Right. Uh, if you click for the background checks, oh, I think it's on the the right hand side of this of when you log into your account. Um, there's a little okay. link that you click, and it brings you to the uh, the identical stuff to uh, go and get that done. Okay, thanks for that information. Yep. Now, as far as unless this has changed as well, I only need to know that you started the background check for for our purposes at the school. You don't have to wait for the results to come in um, to do stuff. Yeah, uh, Friday, once I go do for my appointment, I go Friday and start that process. I'll uh, I'll send the, uh, that documentation over through the email. OK, hey, uh, Kiwan person, I know that you can't see the chat, so you're not seeing where Chris is trying to get your attention. Uh, do you have a question? Yes, uh, my question was with the uh, background check for Tennessee. Should we go ahead and submit presently or after the April 27 date? Go ahead and get it started go ahead now. Get it started now. Okay, and which avenue should I take? I believe for y'all is also through your, your at least your local police department, possibly state. Possibly state. I've not heard of. 
a specific third a specific party. Third party. So, James, but if there is one, if there is one, if there is one, there. Your police your can police tell you, can like, tell if you, you go there to try to get it, they're like, well, you can do this through private party or whatever. Party or whatever. Fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. I just, just my mailing address is Mississippi. I know you mentioned the things about Mississippi, but my permanent address is Tennessee. You're so in, I can uh, still go ahead and Shopping. do. Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Okay. But I can still go ahead and do a regular Tennessee background check. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. In fact, I would, fact, wherever, I would you're, wherever you're, if you're stuck, if you're with, a stuck with a decision between the two, between the two I would say I would go with say the state that you want working, working because they're going to need it. Yeah, okay. That's fine. All right. All right. Go ahead, Evan. Would you I know have? that you have to send it to Jackson in Mississippi. Yeah, well, I just, yeah, every state's going to wind up sending it to the capital. But if you're, like I said, just because you live in South Haven or you have an address in South Haven, if you want to work in Tennessee, then do everything the Tennessee way with them because they're going to be the ones that issue you your license. And if you do everything in Mississippi and then try to get a Tennessee license, you're going to do it all again. So just do it I there. I understand. Do it there. I got you. I just want to double check, but I thought you would say that. Uh, Mr. Rob, I do, Rob, have, a I question. do have a question. Okay. Um, um, you know that I do the travel <laughs> CNA. <laughs> yeah, and, sorry, I'm laughing um, at something Chris just said. Don't listen to Chris on that one. It should be made out they do, Is there anything like once we license, we do our licensure and everything, is there a reciprocity uh, thing that they can do with EMTs as well? To travel? Yeah. Yeah, so, all right, so that's another thing we didn't mention, and, um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and say it because we're being recorded, so this will be picked up, but there, in addition to the National Registry and all the states being National Registry standard now, they've done what's called the compact, um, and they did it because they're trying to make it easier for, like, if there's something that something big happens in a state and that state can't handle it on their own, like not like 9 11 all right so a lot of changes came after 9 11 with nims and the ic and you know you learned um incident command structure and all that stuff and these are ways to make it to where people from different states can come in and do the same job they speak the same language and all that stuff they everybody knows what the ic is and everybody knows how the ics system is built you had to take those classes so they EMS kind of did the same thing. They made it, they call it the compact. And all these states, not all of them, some of them still haven't. So it really just depends on whether your state in general has signed on to this or not. Um, but you can find that information on the NREMT. They very much advertise the crap out of it about who's signed on to the compact. Um, as long as your state's a compact state, your license will work across state lines, should it need to be. Um, if they're not a compact state, then you'd have to get a state license with them to work for them. So some states do it only in contingencies. You still would be very good to call their EMS department for the state and ask them, don't take my word for it because I can't speak for all the different states. But um, if they're a compact state, more than likely they're just gonna let you work with your regular license in that state. Um, some states are gonna be like, not unless we declare a state of emergency, then you can come across. And at that point, you just have to do a reciprocity form to get that state's license if you wanna do traveling. Most states, the reciprocity is easy. It's you fill out a form, you send it in with a copy of your license, give them some money because money makes the world go round. And um, congratulations, you have your new state license. I have another question. Is there a different ambulance service I can do my ride alongs with that don't require COVID vaccine? Um, yeah. I mo that in fact, Acadian is the only company that does currently. So any of our other uh, agreements, you can ride with them. Where where are you located, Lewis? Were you in Slido? I'm trying to remember. Covington, Louisiana. Oh, that's right, Abita Springs. Okay. Um, yeah. So if you are not, if you don't want to ride with Acadian because of the vaccine, you can do North Shore EMS in Bogalusa. You can do Gretna PD in New Orleans. You can do um, AAA in Mississippi. 
So you have to travel a little bit. I know that because Acadian covers your area, but none of those are that far away. Pa yeah, Pafford on the coast doesn't require it. They're, they're taking over Biloxi. Um, by the time you actually start your clinicals, they will be in place, ready to go. They, I think by the end of the month, they have to be up and operational. All right, Tammy, I'm going to read something to you because I don't, I think you said you couldn't see chat either. Um, Chris said an example, he works out of the state of Louisiana. Uh, he has an EMS cert through Mississippi due to his company has, is lo being located in several states. If you work in several states, you need all the states. Um, the compact is kind of changing that, but again, it's so, so hit or miss because it's each state still gets to say how they want it to be. That depending on what state you want to go to, it would probably just behoove you to call their state department of EMS and ask them what they want for you to, to work. Um, for example, Mississippi won't give you a license unless you have med control. So you can't get like in Louisiana, you just apply for your state license and you get it. But Mississippi, you have to have your cert and you have to have med control, which means you have to be employed in the state. So somebody outside of Mississippi usually can't get a, a license unless they're working in the state. Um, I see hands going up and down. Let's see. Oh, it's time. It's break time's over anyway. All right. Um, Evan, I saw yours come up first. I'll answer y'all's two questions and then we're going to get back to it. Unless you want to put it in chat, both of you are logged in. If you, if you want to fill it to Chris. Chris. When is the um, background check due by? Like, when do we need to have it? By your first your clinical. First clinical. Okay. So if you, um, if we reach the point of doing clinicals and your background check's not done yet, you just can't start those until it is. So. You know when the first clinicals will be around, like a date? Yep. I, I, um, um, the way that the we've way got that it we've set got is, it set is, set is set. you're going to have a skill lab on the first Saturday after every module ends. And then the week following that Saturday, we expect you to do one of your clinicals. So for the EMT was, students, that's cut and dry. You have to do it four was me. I was trying to get it together. Um, for the advanced EMT students, obviously you guys are doing this rep based. So saying that four clinicals is enough, I can't tell you that. If you're if it takes you a while to get the right patients to do the right skills, you may wind up doing it more and taking longer. That's all right. Um, you have to have at least one skill lab done though before you can do your clinicals. Cause like for y'all advanced EMT, you're the best example of this. I can't let you stick real people for IVs if you haven't at least done it on an IV arm in a lab. So you have to do one skill lab, but after that skill lab, you are free to do clinicals as often as you want. Um, EMTs, we recommend you doing one within a week of every skill lab because you only have to do four. There's four skill days. It just makes it easier. And every time you go to do your ride alongs, um, you have a section of the class learned because they're the modules are all kind of like agenda based. The first one is patient assessment. You learn your primary assessment, your vital signs and CPR. So your first skill day our first clinical ride, that's what you're doing. Um, then you go into module three in this class, which is all medical emergencies. So on your second skill day, your or skill, second clinical, you're able to do everything that you learned with the patient assessment. And now you know what interventions to give when you're dealing with a medical call. Still haven't had trauma yet. So you're probably gonna be sitting on sitting in the back just watching the trauma calls play out because you haven't been taught what to do. That's okay. Um, your third skill day is done after the trauma module, and then you get to do your third ride along. So now on that one, you're able to do all your vitals, everything for an assessment, intervene on medical, intervene on trauma. And you can kind of see how this builds, right? Like that's the goal with you in the EMT world. For the advanced EMTs, y'all are really more just learning how to do the skills that are being added to your scope. We already know, we expect you to know how to do a patient assessment. So when y'all get to the patient assessment chapters, EMTs are going to go through two nights of it because they're having to learn it. Y'all get it in one night, it's more of a refresher, just to remind you what the registry wants y'all to be doing. Um, awesome. And then, uh, Gibbons, your hand is up. What can I do for you? Or did you, did that get covered in chat? No, it did not. Okay. Um, um, after yeah. we've done, 
I'm hearing some really late. Yeah, I am. That's trippy. Your, your connection must be bad. Um, all right, so our advanced ENT skills, we do have a list of locations for those. You can find them in Planner when you get to that point. And for y'all that are around the Homa area and Mississippi area, um, Bayou Kane is able to do their skills days for you. So y'all can all converge um, right there. So and then after we also have down here at the coast. Are we? After tonight, when we get done with this, this chapter one, we should be able to, um, we should be able to do the test, right? Yes, within 72 hours. Will we hours. get through the whole chapter one that we need to know everything to be able to do the test? Yes. For chapter one? Yes. Okay. Uh, Jaffina, do me a favor because your connection is bad. Rely on the chat for your questions. Just type it in and uh, Chris can answer the questions for you. Uh, AEMT skills are not all done at the end. We would we are happy for you guys to go ahead and get started as soon as you do your first skill day at the end of module two. That way you're not stuck with all the skill requirement to get done before you can take the registry. I want to try to get it to where you can go to registry very close to when the class ends. That way it's also fresh in your mind. Okay, moving forward. Um, remember anybody that as long as you can chat, um, send your questions to Chris in the chat and let him have those discussions. Um, those very few of you that are still logged in as guests and don't see the chat, the only way you can ask a question is to raise your hand and interrupt me. So y'all can just ask the questions, but everybody else, if you don't mind, follow the uh, the chat. All right. So the levels of training are maintained by both federal, state, and local. The federal, that's your national EMS scope that's set by NISTA and it's also controlled by DOT. Uh, DOT, I know a lot of people think that EMS should be under, say, like the Department of Health and then the licensing is. But why does DOT regulate anything to do with EMS? And the answer is simply because we're transport. We use their roads. They want to know, they want to have a say in the operations. They're not, the DOT is not telling you how to do your job. The DOT's regulations have more to do with like the light bars or the fact that every Mississippi ambulance has to have that big orange stripe on it and everything, or it's out of compliance. That's just that's what they're saying is that, you know, DOT gets to make all those rules. Um, they get to dictate what we can put in the trucks. If they deem something too hazardous, then DOT can say no. Like for example, um, there's a lot of talk about ultrasounds and, and not x-rays, but ultrasound machines being put into um, in ambulances. The DOT has the ability to say, no, we don't want ultrasounds on our roads because maybe there's something radioactive in it or whatever. Um, that's that's kind of where they are with that. All right, um, state level laws. They, now you're starting to get down into like state levels of scope, really. The state itself will say, we will allow EMTs to do this, we'll allow paramedics to do this, but they can't do that um, for a long time. And, and also the state level is also what acknowledges certain levels. So. Advanced EMT has existed for a very long time. Excuse me, a very long time. Uh, in Mississippi, it's very new because for the longest time, Mississippi only recognized EMR back when it was called first responder, EMT, and paramedic. There was no advanced EMT recognized by the state. You could you could get EM, a EMT, but you still were in the eyes of the state. You were still an EMT basic, and that's all you could do. You were very well trained. EMT basic. Um, the only way, like in the 90s, I think they still recognize intermediates. And when they stopped doing that around about the early 2000s when I got in, um, if you were already in 
in uh, EMT intermediate from back when the state did accept it, then cool, you were grandfathered over. They kept that until you got out of the system, but they weren't accepting anybody new. So they got to a point where the state said, you come in as an EMT, cool. If you progress, you progress to paramedic. We're not doing anything with this advanced EMT stuff. It was necessity to change that. When they got to the point where they, they just weren't enough paramedics to go around, Mississippi had to be like, okay, well, we got to have some other kind of option here. So we're going to start taking advanced EMTs. And now they're they're flourishing. Advanced EMT is flourishing because they can do a whole lot of stuff to alleviate the pressure on a paramedic. And as you guys are going to notice, the reason that I've got you all in the same class as the basics is because your class is the same length. There's no no year long course and a ton of, you know, 500 hours of clinicals that you have to do like you have to do for a paramedic. Um, and we're working on a bridge, but again, that has to be approved and that's state regulations as slow as it's down. Um, the local level, that's your med director for your actual company that you work for. So in these senses, you can look at it like this. The, the national standard says that an EMT can do this long list of things. And if you look at national standard, it's pretty impressive what an EMT can do or an advanced EMT. And it's kind of scary what a paramedic can do. Um, most states don't just say you can do everything on the national standard because the list is very, very, very long. Um, so the states, the states themselves will say, okay, cool. Well, I don't want anybody in our state doing this. And they start scratching things out. Um, but the state tries not to micromanage too much. So they only scratch out the things that they really don't want to happen anywhere. And then they pass that down to the local level to the fire departments, to the ambulance companies, and every ambulance has a med director, and he's looking at what he gets to work with, and he's like, all right, yeah, cool. Um, I'm not gonna let him do this either, or this. And so what's left is what you can do, that's your scope. So when you go from one ambulance company to another, you might be able to do something you couldn't do before, or you may lose the ability to do something that you did before. So it's important as you change jobs, to really familiarize yourself with the protocols of where you work, because that's what that's what the determination is. I was uh, when I first started off in EMS, I was on a border town of the Mississippi River with Louisiana, and so all I had to do was drive 19 miles from my house to the west and work in an uh, ambulance district that allowed me to do almost twice as much as what I could do in e in Mississippi, because Mississippi was so restrictive. And because of that, on those border areas, a lot of times they were having a hard time staffing their trucks because nobody wanted to work for them. They couldn't really operate in their in what they were comfortable doing and what they felt like they'd be able to do. So they all flocked across the river and went to work in Arkansas and um, Louisiana because the protocols were at the time they were much more progressive. So the fun factor of it was over there, not here. Um, that had, again, that's changed, but that's the way that it was for a long time, even after I got in. All right. So you can kind of see here the level of training that state, local, everything where they overlap. They don't really overlap. It's that's a bad way of doing it. It really should be more like a uh, like a flow chart. It comes down, you get big toolbox. Somebody takes some stuff out of it. Somebody else takes some stuff out of it. What's left is what you get to do. All right. Public BLS and immediate aid. Uh, millions of lay people are trained in BLS and CPR. Most lay people are not trained in BLS. That's a misnomer. Uh, BLS is really meant for healthcare providers because we're teaching you how to use the BVM and we're teaching you about pulse checks and all this other stuff. And there's a whole facility aspect to BLS that you can go through if you work in, the, in an, like a hospital. But CPR is taught to a lot of people all the way down to just compressions. If you're, I don't know, 15 years old and you're not doing anything medical you're not you're not working anywhere you're not in any in anything that you think you're going to come across somebody that gets hurt they're still technically teaching hands only cpr which is which means you're going to if they're unconscious you start compressions if they come up and swing at you stop compressions um it's wild that they do that but they do uh aeds are getting more and more common uh, in fact if you've taken one of our classes i always point out that the pictures on the pads don't matter, right? Like you have the chest pad, the ab pad. If you place them on there, then you, you oh crap, this is the ab pad. It doesn't matter. Well, why is it still there if it doesn't matter? It's because the average person doesn't know that. Um, 
So if somebody that's not been trained comes up and they grab it and they don't even know what it is, but they're like, there we go. And then they put it on the patient. The pictures still help. Um, if they reverse them, it's okay, but they don't have to know that. So, but you as the provider, when we get to that level, that lecture, um, I'll tell you then why the pads don't, why the pictures don't matter. It's like, whose line is it anyway? The points are made up and or the rules are made up and the points don't matter. All right. Um, EMRs. So this includes local law enforcement officers, firefighters that don't transport. And that's changing because a lot of fire departments are starting to really up their EMT, uh, EMS certifications. But a lot of what you do is you just stop the situation from getting any worse. So you show up and a guy's bursting in the flames, you put the flames out and that's it. You, a lot of your um, treatment is done at the higher levels. Y'all don't need to know the Parkland formula. You're not going to be giving fluids. You don't have to know um, as an EMR, you really don't have to get too intricate in how you're going to bandage a wound. It's just, you know, dry if it's, uh, I'm sorry, wet bandage if it's anything other than a third degree, dry bandage if it's a third degree. Um, focus on providing BLS and urgent care with limited equipment. The idea is that the EMR should be able to do 90% of his job with nothing. And again, that's because you're trained one level above first aid. We're not making you MacGyver. We're just, your scope is so limited. You don't, you don't need anything. Most of it's out of your scope. And I, <laughs> every time I change the slide, I see you um, taking pictures. You, you don't forget the, uh, the slideshow itself. You can download the whole thing. Uh, from the show. I know, but it's just easier for me to do it and make my notes and then study from it. Okay. It's just something that I do. Whatever works. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. So you can do EMR. They didn't say on that last slide. Most EMR classes are around 80 hours. So if you're doing it nine to five, you'd be done in two weeks. Um, EMT, because you have more of a scope and now we have to build in clinical hours and stuff like that. Now your, your time is going to jump. So 150 to 200 hours for an ENT student. Um, ENT has more knowledge than the EMR, and it's clinical. Most of your expanding, what you're expanding, when, like I said earlier, when you're going up those levels is your clinical abilities. You're able to give more drugs. You're able to um, check more vitals. Like a, an EMR is not going to understand, not by what they're trained. I mean, there are very smart EMRs out there. But by their training, they don't learn anything about end title. That's just why, because they don't use a monitor. So there's no way for them to judge or get that information. So why teach it to them? Um, 12 leads, reading, reading any kind of EKG strip, that's out of scope. Advanced ENT students, y'all are the first level to start doing anything with a strip. And all you have to do, and all you're really trained to do, is set up the 12 lead and transmit it. You don't actually interpret it. That's a paramedic skill. So, but but the same thing apply. You can kind of see what I'm saying. Like, it's not that you're fixing broken legs in the field. An EMR and a paramedic splint the leg the same way. But your clinical side, it, that's what grows. All right. AEMTs, you guys get the IV therapy, um, some advanced airway adjuncts. You're still not doing the ET tube unless you live in Ohio, in which case advanced EMTs do have um, ET tube skills, and I think Indiana allows it too. I'm, I'm serious, and, and Chris, you're the, you're the paramedic in the room, man. Um, it's going to get to a point where that's because you've got, at the same time that AEMTs are becoming more and more common, there's this huge push to make all paramedics associate's degrees, no more certifications. Um, that's fine, and that's good for the knowledge of the field. But the problem is, you don't get paid the level of if you're gonna if you're gonna push a two year degree on every paramedic. Congratulations, you just made every paramedic go to nursing school. Because why would they not at that point? And there's we can have some that's some podcast episode uh, conversations to have there. <clears throat> I love it. I think it, I think it'd be great, but they. You need a serious pay raise if they're going to push a, uh, a degree on you at the same time. Otherwise, why wouldn't you be a nurse? And that will that's going to be the nail in the coffin. If they do that and they don't do it right, they're going to that could kill EMS. All right, um, you guys can give some medications. So you're going to recognize some names like like I said, you know, lidocaine, Narcan. Um, not lidocaine is an ACLS drug. So we really can't say that AEMTs don't do. Um, 
ACLS drugs. You just don't do all of them. So because of that, if you want to step out of lane a little bit, if you want to get ACLS, you can do it as an advanced CMT. If you want to teach ACLS, you can do it as an advanced CMT because the requirements to teach ACLS and PALS are that you just have to have the skills in your scope. And they removed the ET tube as a required skill for ACLS. They still call it, it's still a gold standard, but the curriculum says that it's an optional skill now because if an OPA gets the job done, use an OPA. If you have Kings or LMAs of any type, um, use those. And so now that that just brought ACLS down into the AEMT skill set. So it's, yeah, saying that some levels do this and some don't, those lines are starting to blur a little bit. Um, paramedics, you guys get to do all kinds of stuff because you go to school and earn the right to do so. You have definitely put in your time to be able to give epi and, that, and knowing the difference between amiodarone and lidocaine and why you would use one versus the other. Um, it's kind of sad to me that more paramedics don't seem to remember that. But you you know you have a you have a drug box of like I don't know Chris how many how many drugs can you give as a paramedic do you know off the top of your head you can type it I know you I know you can't really um, talk I don't I don't know the number but it's it also depends on where you're located in the country some drugs you have more ability to push in different areas than you do versus like Central Mississippi area right. I know there was something like 46 or 48 drugs you had to know just to get through school. But that wasn't all inclusive. That was just what you needed to know to get through your testing. Um, if I recall right, there was like the, my, my my drug pamphlet. I'll upload it so y'all can see it. But just know that at the, class, at the levels that we're teaching right now, y'all don't have to know all those drugs. Thank God. Because it's a pharmacology is a beast for the paramedic programs. All right. Um, but yeah, you are you are basically an extension of a doctor as a paramedic, and it's becoming more so. The um, the EMS 2025 push is really getting a lot more. They're focusing more on, from what I can gather from the updates, um, communication increases and also outreach. So as it stands right now, EMS is meant to go out into the field, stabilize, and carry them to the hospital if they can't be blessed to, to go back to normal life. If, you know, if we show up and we fix dia of a diabetic episode, we wake them up and we're like, hey, man, eat a sandwich. And then we just go back to the station, right? Because we fixed it. Um, the EMS 2025 push or 2050 push is trying to go more down that route than saying, hey, we woke you up. We know you got diabetes. You know you got diabetes. You're fixed, but you still got to go to the doctor for him to say, yep, you got diabetes, go home. Um, there's, it just overloads the hospitals. So they're trying to build um, better EPCR connectivity. They're trying to build more like drone technology to help get things to people. So for example, um, one of the one of the scenarios I read and I thought it was pretty cool. If y'all haven't seen this, that's you can I'll put it up so you can read it and see where EMS is going. Um, somebody falls, gets gets stung like a little kid gets stung by a bee in her yard and she's allergic and she's got this little thing that looks like a hearing aid that detects a histamine response and suddenly automatically activates this this neighborhood drone that comes over and drops an EpiPen by her and then the, it notifies people in the preset list of like you know the retired respiratory tech that lives next door suddenly gets a ding on his phone that says the kid next door is having an allergic reaction so he runs over meets the kid has now has the EpiPen and issues it 911 is already called and blah blah. I'm like, I'm like, I don't know what this is cool, um, and it is definitely attainable. But it's interesting to me, like what they're trying to get it to go to. Uh, I meant to bring that up on a previous slide because I saw they they had it in the, in the slide. It mentioned uh, EMS 20, 2050. Um, that's a good read. It's a pretty good little thing. They they started in 2019, and they're expecting to get a lot of those things activated. Um, in the next 10 years. And if any of y'all have an entre entrepreneurial mindset, there's a lot of openings and ideas for new businesses to pop up that can help meet the needs of what EMS is trying to go to. So just some uh, random food for thought. 
Okay, I, I, have a, on. I have a question. I have well, I have a little information to share. Um, for those who are in Region One in Louisiana that are in this classroom, I don't know if you're aware of that, but I went through a training class with Region One, where they actually give out, they have us give out free Narcan to anyone who wants it. To me, that's enabling the enabler. When you arrive on a scene and you got your basic who or the police officer or the firefighter, whoever's first on scene and it's an overdose, unresponsive patient, but breathing and the parents are saying that he took some drugs. Well, then they shoot him up with the nasal spray to either two milligrams or four. Did you mute yourself? I'm sorry, I was muted. Okay, let me start over. I'm sorry. Um, no, that's all right. Hey, actually, um, hold on on that conversation because that's again, that's a good, that's a big discussion. Uh, and in fact, that's a great discussion for the toxicology night. If you want to save it for that, okay, that's fine. We're, I'll we're save gonna, it for we're gonna that. go into that. Yep. That and and the reason I say that's that's a good discussion topic. Um, because I sat in, I sat in, a, I sat. In, for seven days, I sat in lectures for that. For seven full days with Region One. You muted yourself again. <laughs> I sat in lecture for seven days, trying to understand why they're doing this, but they're doing it. And to me, I mean, I have a lot to say about it, and and I have a lot of lecture literature on it as well. But, you know, when you go to a scene and the patient's family says, please help him, patient wakes up and is like, well, how much did you give me and why did you give it to you? Well, it's because your family member said you were unresponsive, but you were breathing. So, you know, but yeah, I'll save that for, for that for that class. For yeah, sure. I save it for that. I'm be, I'm gonna, I will be here that night because I have a slightly dissenting opinion. Um, <laughs> I think it'd be a good it'd be a good conversation because I'm not knocking to on me, you're enabling the enabler. OK, I see that. I see where you're coming from. I'm not saying you're wrong. Not by any means. I just have a different. No, take I know. On it I know. I right. So and everybody has their own take. But yeah. It, it's so it's crazy. It is. And you're in some people you are enabling. You're right. But there's a lot of people that they prescribed the med. And maybe they didn't intend to Correct. overdose. It wasn't a it wasn't recreational. So we can't can't paint everybody with the same brush, right? So that's right. I see why I can see why it depends on the there. situation. It just right. yeah, but that's that'd be a great conversation for um for the toxicology night because we go into that. That's one of the main topics of that night. So okay. don't 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 lose it. Don't forget it. But when we get to that point, I, that's about that. <laughs> the halfway point of the class. Oh yeah, and I'm sure we're gonna it'll it'll if you do, it's gonna remind you're gonna be reminded when we get to the when we get to it. All right. Um, let me get back to the slides. So public access 911, which has also had its own evolution over the years. Uh, E911 became a thing, and then people started calling from cell phones. And so the basic reverse caller ID didn't really do its job anymore. So now they can actually pinpoint where your uh, phone is when you call, which is pretty cool. Um, so it's it's grown a lot. Dispatchers, um, those of you down in the Homa Bayou Cane area, the last uh, couple of people to come through our class, one of them was a dispatcher for y'all. And it was amazing to me how much training they were putting her through to be a dispatcher. She was going through advanced EMT. That's awesome. It, you know, and where I when I worked as a dispatcher in Pro River County, Mississippi, they didn't I didn't even know anything other than how to operate the computer. And that was it. Uh, the fact that I that I was a firefighter, they didn't care. Uh, it drove me insane because I was like, I can help these people. And they're like, nope, nope, it's not your job. You're supposed to just get the fire department out there. And if they don't answer, then they don't answer. And tough, you know. Um, but I've seen some now that I've met her. Y'all y'all really have a good dispatch system out there. And I think Louisiana as a whole does. Because y'all also have, what is it called, LEARN? That's... um. The emergency response network or something like that where you can tell people where to go y'all y'all are directing to the right hospital and everything 
um, based on what the page, what the ambulance is picking up. That's that's pretty cool. Because if an, if a hospital is overloaded, you all know that the the person responding to the scene may not know that. So that really helps with dispersing things. There's it's dispatch has come a long way. Emergency medical dispatch system was what I was just talking about, and then mobile apps that assist with layperson CPR and AED location. So if you all have seen the app called uh, Pulse Point, not a lot of places down here use it. Um, I've noticed that because I downloaded it, but I'm, I'm working on another app that's basically going to do the same thing. We're going to market it through Aries, but basically every you would download it, and if uh, every any any person that falls out, hopefully they have it or somebody walking by them has it, they activate it. And it pings out your location to everybody else has got that app. And in the app, you set yourself up as either a responder or a non-responder. So all the ones that are flagged as responders get it and say, hey, here's somebody that's got a cardiac arrest incident going on. And by the way, your AED is 100 yards in the other direction. So that app, and there's, like I said, Pulse Points out there, um, they don't do it that that well because they make the fire departments activate it. But um if you don't want to run all the way over here, find your patient, find out his cardiac arrest, and then have to go all the way back past where you started to get the AED and then come all the way back again, it's just using up time. But um, these apps already exist. The Aries app is coming. Um, it's pretty, it's, it's, it helps. It really helps with that community response because sometimes it may take an ambulance, at least in this area, we've had problems where it's taken an ambulance 45 minutes to get there, and you wouldn't think that would happen in the city, but it does when 911 is overloaded. So that really benefits. We teach CPR to everybody. Why not have a great way to get them activated when they need to be? All I right, had so Pulse you... Point in California, and uh, we mainly used it because it would show, like, if I followed the fire department that we would respond with it mm -hmm. gave me a list of their calls and then there was a separate app that pulse point used that would activate like you can sign up if you were cpr certified or something that would you know send you a notification if somebody nearby was in cardiac arrest or something it's a great app i loved it i wish we had it here yeah and i think one of the biggest problems that i have with pulse point is that if your fire department in the, your area doesn't activate it and embrace it, you don't see anything. You're just, you're looking at an empty map when you open the phone. So that's why the one that we're making, and I'm not turning this into an advertisement for that app, but uh, it's not gonna rely on it. It will be a strictly community driven, you upload your certs to verify that you can respond to this kind of a call. If you don't upload the cert, you don't get the notification for it. And um, the app will track your expirations and everything. So that if you expire, you stop getting um, notifications for that. That way the responders all theoretically are able and trained to do what they need to do. It'll activate 911, but it doesn't, Pulse Point has to route through the fire department and then to your phone. This is going to go from the point of the call of the, where the patient is at to everybody in a, in a range. So if you're walking around in a mall, for example, and somebody falls out of the Sears and you get the, the ping, cool. But if you're 10 miles away, you don't see that. By the time you get there, the ambulance should technically be there or somebody local would be there. Um, so it's really more of like a crowd sourcing thing. Anyway, um, the EMS Agenda 2050 is really working to try to push that out there because they're really, again, they're trying to get it to where um, we get more training, more stuff out into the field and it's easier access before the ambulance comes there. We're considered first responders now because we're the first ones on the scene. But it's if you think about it, that's been a long time since that's been accurate. Usually it's somebody's already doing CPR and it comes across dispatch, CPR in progress or something like that. There's your first responder. It's not the ambulance. Um, in fact, the police tend to get there faster than ambulance and fire most of the time. I think some right. of the smaller fire departments around um, Mortridge and Parish have that pulse point because they're dispatched through their phone instead of through the walkies anymore. Yeah, well, Abita Springs uses a uh, app, but it's not Pulse Point. It's, um, I forget what it is, but it's strictly, it's, it's not meant to go to anybody other than the firefighters and dispatch hits that app. And by you, Kane, I think y'all have a, a system as well, because I saw the thing, the TV up on the wall. Yeah, that, that, 
that may be what it is. I mean, talk- something is is there. Yeah, we use um, first arriving at Bayou Cane. I know the rest of the state uses Active 911, which is an app on your phone. Yeah, active is active is what I use it to be the springs. And I saw y'all's. I love y'all's. I did the TV up there that had everything displayed and the weather and all that was. That's some pretty cool stuff. Like it's it's awesome what technology is starting to do now. When I got in, it was just a Motorola radio, and if you didn't understand the dispatcher, you were just calling on your cell phone and having to tell you there. Um. All right, Med Director. I, I just want to say what we have. We use Active Alert and we use First Do. Okay. So I don't know if y- y'all heard of those, but it does pinpoint First Do and Active Alert does pinpoint uh, where. Robert, you're muted too. Don't know how that happened. Um, so what we'll do, we have the Discord server. It was not me. <laughs> okay, I'll take your word for it. Uh, I tell you what, if my computer decides to get possessed and mute me again, y'all just let me know. But um. We have a Discord server that I'm trying to get everybody in, and the idea is that you guys could continue to network there, um, both among yourselves and also as we get first responders as a whole in it. So y'all do me a favor while I'm on this tangent. Get your coworkers into the Discord. It is it is messed up at the moment. I know that the when you come in, it's supposed to ask you what your avenue of public safety is, like fire and police and everything. Um, we are trying to fix that issue. But I want I want the Discord server to be a big community building um, where we can you can mentor each other, you can find job postings. You y'all use a new program that somebody's may never heard of, put it in there. Um, these kind of things will help public safety as a whole. You know, y'all find a really awesome tool that's great for you, but nobody else benefits if they don't know about it. So that's kind of what I'm trying to derive with that. Uh, we used to, once upon a time, those of you that have been here before, we tried to use Discord for a while as actually part of the class, and it didn't work. So I'm switching gears of what we use it for now. It's just a community building thing, so you don't have to join it, but I would love for you to. I would love to see the Discord server really blow up with a bunch of um, public safety first responders from all walks. All right, um, all right so I'm going to foot stomp this slide because I know it's on the test. Medical control can be offline or online. Does anybody in here, uh, I'll tell you what, EMT students first. If you're an advanced EMT student, I know you know what this means. But EMT students, can you tell me the difference between offline and online med control? Is it offline? Is something that you already know that's like a, a set standard and online is they directly telling you? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So an example of that would be you show up to a patient that's blue, right? They look like a Smurf. What are we going to do? We're going to give them oxygen. That's always going to happen. That's you, you know, two plus two equals four. You're going to, you're going to do this. Uh, but there are some things that we do, particularly like giving nitro. All right. Now a paramedic can, I, I believe, can make that determination on his own. But as an EMT, you have to gather all this information and then you have to call the doc and get the doc to give you permission to give it. Um, that's online. You have to have the 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 med control or the medical director that's on board at the time, which is usually a doctor walking around in an ER with his own students. Um, what is the password for the test? Oh, you got that, Chris. All right. Um, you have to get his permission on the spot. You can't do it without that, and you have to get it every single time. So. Doc tells you, yeah, you can give nitro on one call and then you respond to the same call later with a different person or even the same person. You still have to call them back. Um, That can, I want to make sure you guys understand though who you're calling when you do that. This is not a doctor that's sitting at a desk waiting for you to answer, to call him to answer the phone. This is usually an overworked doctor in an ER somewhere that's about to go have a drink and pull his hair out because he's overloaded with patients and you called him to ask permission to give nitro as you should. But if you don't have all the information that he needs to give you the answer, your answer is probably going to be something really loud and not what I would uh, 
say in class. So make sure that you are ready for that conversation when you call. All right. Because yeah, a lot of times they're holding the phone up talking to you while they're directing a code or something like that. And it could be it can be pretty hectic for them. Um, so we will train you to make sure that you don't do that. Training for calls and practices follow state legislation. Um, in Mississippi is in the process of rewriting some of theirs, and I don't know a lot of the details of what's coming, but I'm thinking that it's going to be some good things to catch Mississippi up to the rest of the country a little bit better. So I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to happen. I know California is also rewriting some of their laws, even though we don't have any California students in here. Um, even, even down to um, entities like the VA. Veterans Affairs is changing some of their vocabulary and stuff to, to make things a little bit more controlled, and that's going to be a good thing. Senior EMS officials will handle tasks like scheduling, personnel, budgets, purchasing, and vehicle maintenance. So a lot of people assume that EMS is kind of a, like a, a one-level dead-end job, where it's like you, you have your level of training, but you work the streets. It, it's all operations, and that's not true. Um, if you think about it, if you look at your average ambulance a agency, you have the people working the truck, then you have your field training officers, which you typically work in the truck as well. Then you have your regional directors, then you have all the admin that's up there as well. Um, there is upward mobility at EMS. The problem is, is that we do a really poor job of making sure people know what those progression routes are and how to um, how to go for them. In the fire service, we've got it mastered, right? Here's your progression path from first day to chief. You will work this many years. You will get these certs. You will go to captain. You get captain, you get your next cert. Now you go to battalion chief if you've got that or, you know, whatever. We're really good in the fire service with it. But EMS is like, oh, yeah, cool. You're an EMT. Get on the truck. You want to make a career at this? Cool. And that's as far as it goes. And it's like, so you get people that spend 30 years on the truck and they could have long since moved up into administration and they never did, not because they didn't want to, but because they didn't know how. Um, going over that's out of the purview of this class, but if you like EMS and you want to make a career of it, you don't have to stay on the bottom rung the whole time, but you might have to do some digging to figure out how to move up. So we do integrate certain health services already. Um, that's again, becoming more of a thing with the 2050 push. So pre-hospital care is coordinated with hospital care. Your online med control is basically doing that. Even the stuff that we do in somebody's living room that we don't plan on bringing them to the hospital um, is in coordination with the, with the hospital care. Um, something as simple as being given a diabetic sugar. Yeah. Uh, AEMT or a paramedic is going to walk in and do that because it's a standing order. If their sugar is low, you give them sugar. But you'll learn too as you go through it. So some of you at the higher levels, uh, just because a vital sign is out of range doesn't mean that we need to fix it. If somebody's got a high pulse, your answer is not, okay, I'm going to bring the pulse down. Because what if the pulse is high to maintain the blood pressure? You just crashed your patient. So you have to get that bigger view, that bigger overview. Sometimes that means coordinating with um, their their PCP or the ER. You know, maybe they just got released from the ER six hours ago. It'd be nice to know what they were doing there before we give some kind of care. Pre-hospital care is continued in the emergency department once you get them there. Um, and then a lot of times they'll have specialty stuff that they do after that. So once they get through the ER, the ER kind of disperses them out. Some go home, some go to ICU, some go to surgery. Some will see a specialist. It just depends on what the problem is with the patient. But there's a, a progression to it all. We're pretty early in it, so we get to deal with the fun stuff of the uh, unstable patients. But, you know, all the money's in the hospitals, it seems like. So mobile integrated health care. Um, what time is it? I tell you what, let's, nah, well, we started at 10 after. Uh, we'll take a break in seven minutes, but we're not there yet. So the idea here is that we're going to use the pre-hospital spectrum, in other words, EMS, um, but we're going to do a lot more stuff that feels like what a doctor would do or a hospital would do. So paramedics have the ability to progress their training into what's called critical care paramedic, and then there's also community medicine, community, par uh, community paramedicine. But, um, 
that basically is some follow on training for the basic paramedic to be able to do some things beyond their normal scope that will allow the patient to stay home. Again, and a lot of this is in a push to not overload the ERs. So there's a lot of these things that are coming up and they're there. This is again where 2050 is trying to go to make this more at the forefront. Um, this evolved with the goal to facilitate improved access to health care at an affordable price and to not overload the hospitals. Because what sucks is going into the ER and then standing on the wall. And we were having to do that before COVID, and it just that just made it even worse. Um, MIH created additional training levels for EMS providers. Like I said, you have community paramedics, um, different things. Paramedic is almost a career field in itself. Because once you get there, you can go the flight paramedic route, you can go the community paramedic route, you can do what Chris does and be it, um, the primary caregiver at an, on an offshore rigs if you want to go work in the industry as a safety rep. Um, he's primed to take those jobs. So there's a lot of stuff you can do that doesn't require an ambulance. Not every not everything in EMS is on an ambulance. IS or information systems. Um, this is basically the technology side. So I know when I first came into EMS, the coolest thing we had was that the dispatchers could track the ambulances in real time. So if I missed a turn, they can come across the radio and be like, hey, you, you missed your turn. Back up and, and make that next left. Um, uh, they, you know, especially out in the in the sticks, as we call it. You stop getting road signs. It just becomes dirt roads and, and you don't know where you are. Um, and then we got Wi-Fi in the trucks, and that was the coolest thing since sliced bread, because I could do these new EPCRs that we were doing instead of using paper, and I could just upload everything from the Wi-Fi that was in the truck. Um, so it's come a long way, and that's what this is going on about. Um, this is also getting a big push in 2050, because the idea is like it, we already have uh, EPCRs that you know, the next link in the chain can see what you've done. But um, for the most part, EMS doesn't get to see the medical record of their patient. So if they just had a surgery three weeks ago, and that might be a very important thing for us, um, we don't know about it. And if they forget to tell us, then we really don't know. And so you get this, this thing where um, if those of you that have been EMTs in the system, you show up to a patient's living room, they give you one spill, you operate based on that information, you get them to the ER and they tell the doctor something completely different. And now you look like an idiot because you went down this route and that had nothing to do with what they just told the doctor. So you're standing there like, well, crap. Um, or maybe like I said, there's some medical history thing that you didn't catch because they didn't tell you. And um, that just invalidates your entire treatment plan, sometimes for a detrimental level. I agree. The paper PCRs were easier because they didn't change. However, uh, the EPCRs, once you get used to them and the little, like how the flagging system is set up, it's not so bad. Um, especially if you can copy like your, your narrative, if you can make some copies of the regular ones, like your routine patients, that your, your narrative is going to look the same on almost all of them. Copy and paste it into a notepad on your laptop so that, if, that all the diabetic patients you run, you just copy paste change the names and the vitals, and there you go. Um, but the 2050 push, what I like about it is, hopefully here soon, we're going to have the same access to a patient's medical records that the hospital has. So when you show up to somebody's living room, before you get them there, before the, the, the next level of care gets them, you don't have to ask sample so much and worry about getting bad information. You can just look at the medical record. You still have to ask the other questions, you know, do you have any allergies? Because sometimes I would change. What were you doing when it happened? What makes it hurt better or worse? Blah, blah, blah. But when you get to the medical history, pertinent medical history, your patient may not know what to tell you because they don't know what's important. So the, the tech is still evolving. It really sucked when it first came out. It still kind of sucks. I'll give you that. But it is a lot better. And hopefully in the next few years, it'll be even better. All right. Continuous quality improvement. Uh, they really harp on this in the military. So the idea is that this is a never ending loop to try to make things better. So you you um, basically you're going to look at how your organization is running and you're going to identify areas of need. Then you're going to plan ways to improve those areas 
then you're going to institute those plans and then you're going to evaluate them and see if they worked and if they worked then fantastic if they didn't then all right back to the drawing board um but now you're back at the planning stage so the last couple of things you implemented made you better but those were only a few things it wasn't a whole overhaul now you're back at the planning stage you look again all right well we fixed these so now these are the lowest performing things so you go through the cycle again you fix those now these are the you know what i'm saying so it's a continuous thing uh, and that's important because you may have the perfect policies and for everything in that snapshot in time but five years from now when technology has changed the uh, demographics in your area have changed maybe you don't have as many elderly as you used to have um you're not getting as many ifts because maybe some of those nursing homes shut down or um your you have less trucks on the road you know stuff like that the policies that worked 10 years ago and they were they were fantastic policies they may just not fit anymore so this is a continuous thing um it is a headache to some people but this is one of those things that you just kind of have to embrace because this is what keeps you current Minimize medical errors um, that occur as a result of a rules-based failure, knowledge-based failure, or a skills-based failure, or any kind of combination. So basically, you're just putting patient safety first. As long as you have that as your priority, um, typically, you're going to not let these things happen. <clears throat> Finance, I'm not too worried about. I'm not really going to put you all on that. All right, so EMS and structures. This is kind of like if you're sitting in this class going, why are you teaching me? Some of y'all may have been in EMS longer than me. Chris has been in it since the early 2000s. I came in in 2008. Um, I came into the fire service in 06, but I didn't actually get my EMT until 2007. By the time I started working on an ambulance, it was already 2008. Um, I don't know everything that's out there, and I'll be the first one to tell you that. There's, there's actually uh, one of our advanced EMT students and our EMT students asked me a question, I think last night, that um, really threw me for a loop on something like chronic, no, was it chronic, Irvin, either of y'all still active? What was the question you asked me the other night? Was something with the it. coronary yeah. arteries. Do what? It was, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So it was a um, uh, unsteady vasospasm occlusion. And it's where, like, during an episode of uh, vasospasm, like with ACS, you know, where mm -hmm. the coronary artery is constantly constricting and dilating, you know what I mean? It's like spasming. That's kind yeah, of where that's I, like, it's, it's where that's like unsteady and it just kind of clamps down. I got you. Yeah, see, I'd never heard of that. I mean... I, I learned something new and that's one of the cool things about being the instructor is that I, I learned from y'all. You asked me a question. I've never heard of it before, so I'm going to Google it and that makes me better. Um, but to let you know, most EMS instructors have to be licensed and approved by the states. The states say that the, the states get to dictate whether a school exists and they set the standards for the EMS instructors. There is training out there. Um, the National Association of EMS Educators or NIMSI um they have a program it's a two-part instructor program that you can take the air force has their own that's the one that i took that was based on the NIMSI standards um and thankfully you know i didn't have to reinvent the wheel louisiana looked at it and we're like yeah that's the same standard so we'll accept it um but every state has their own rules in mississippi you don't have to take an ems educator course shocker um you just have to be one level above the level that you're training so Chris, uh, for example, has not, to my knowledge, gone through an EMS instructor course. That does not mean he doesn't know what he's talking about. He just did not go through the official course. He didn't have to. The standards didn't tell him to. Um, I do plan on, we, we're building up our own EMS instructor program in the company, um, and everybody's going to go through it, whether they've been through one before or not. It's not going to take long. Sorry, Chris, I hate to break the news to you here. But um it's just to kind of get our way of doing things out. Um, and it'll be more of a round table thing because you've taught for a while now, uh, for a lot longer than just with us. And so it'll be, it'll be good, but this will be a good way to get new instructors on board and get them caught up as well. So the instructor training is out there, but it's not like fire certifications. It's not saying that you have to be 
um, a fire instructor one to teach a class. They're just there. They're they're optional classes. Some states require it. Some states don't. Louisiana doesn't actually require it. If you have fire instructor two, you meet the Louisiana requirements to be an EMS instructor. Um, like I said, Mississippi and a lot of other states, they don't even care. They guess as long as you, their their mindset is if you're trained ahead of what you're teaching, you must know everything that you're teaching or you wouldn't have your cert. So uh, different states look at it different ways. Most EMS training programs must adhere to national standards. It's absolutely true. If we stray from that, then you guys don't get to take the national registry and we will be wiped out of existence because who wants to take a class that doesn't let you get your certification? Continuing education, refresher courses, computer-based or mannequin-based self-age education exercises. Um, we use a lot of these and we're actually trying to do something fairly different here soon. Um, you guys are in a hybrid program, right? So that's computer-based but not like just watching YouTube videos. We're all live in this room. Most of you, I think, are still awake. I can't really tell. But um, yeah, <laughs> I see I see you, Jared. Um, you, this is a hybrid program. So you guys are going to have skill labs that put the hands-on stuff into it as well. So you get all of it. We're utilizing the technology to enhance the course, not replace it. Um, something we're doing on the refresher side is we're building a escape room refresher so actually our skill location here in Biloxi is right next door to an escape room and what we're doing is we're making it where you go into room one and you have to answer all these questions and puzzles regarding whatever the topic of the of the refresher is to get your equipment and you only have x amount of time to do it so you go through you solve this puzzle you get your stethoscope you go and you solve this one and you get your monitor if you need it and stuff like that after the timer runs up the door opens to the other side of the room and you have a patient that you have to treat. Um, and you only have the equipment that you were able to unlock. So when you're done with it, though, you get your your CE hour and all you did was play a game. And to be CAPC accredited, you have to um, have a test at the end. So the way that we're doing it is that the questions you answered in the beginning, that is your test. Those are your test questions. So there you, there you go. As long as you've got um, X amount of those things solved, you passed. And it's just a it's a better way of doing it because I mean, I don't know about y'all. I don't like like there's no skills to refresher classes if you're doing them on virtual. When we do virtual refreshers, this is it. And it's boring. It's boring for me. You know, the instructor, we I'm just drumming on with a slideshow. So I think the idea of something like that is a great way to get those refresher hours out there. But the cool thing is, is that there's there's nifty ways to do it. Um, we just got to find them, and that's on us as schools. That's on y'all to know that there's different ways to do it. So if you come up to me and you're like, hey, I can do this as an escape room, surely not. But yes, yes, you can. As long as it's accredited, it counts. All right. Um, prevention and public education. I don't know. We're past our eight o'clock time. So take a break. Uh, 10 minutes. Be back at 17 after. I'm not going to say the hour because we have different time zones in here. So be back in 10 minutes. What do you got, Chris? Oh, I see. Yeah, no, I was talking to Kersey. Y'all didn't miss anything. Well, you did, but yeah, we're trying to figure out what we're going to eat for dinner. Thank you for letting me know, though. Hopefully y'all can hear me now. Somebody give me a sign of life. Can y'all hear me? Yes, okay. I can hear you. Yeah, we, we can hear you. All right, perfect. All right. All right. Chris, put your hand down, please. That way I'll I'll know when you need to raise it again. If you can. And I'm gonna pick back up teaching. All right, so we talked about that. Um, <clears throat> public health, the difference, what, all right, so now that we are all back, can somebody tell me what the difference between public health is and us as medical responders as a whole? You can use this, um, this chart here to kind of give you a hint about what the two missions are.
Well, we kind of, we kind of like help the public, but that's like helping the public with different things. Right. Like vaccines and things like that. We help the public as an emergency. Exactly. So one of the biggest differences is that they are proactive and they are more interested in herd or like large population. They, 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 what they do is not for a specific person. What they do is, um, they do things that are supposed to help huge swaths of society at once. So vaccines like the TB vaccine, um, the uh, rabies vaccine, things like that, um, those come from public health. The um, fluoride, fluoride in the water, when public health gets to do its job, things like Flint, Michigan don't happen. Um, when they get, when they kind of get hamstrung and can't do what they're supposed to do, then things slip under the radar. Uh, something else that's pretty cool that public health does, uh, public health is a, is a field, it's not a, a department. So there's multiple departments that do public health, but public health is a proactive approach to, to health care. We are not proactive people, right? We sit around and we wait for 911. And when that when that happens, then we go fix somebody, but we're waiting for the problem to happen. That means we're a reactive um, field. Public health is a proactive field. They, they put policies in place to try to stop the issues from happening before they do. So helmet laws, like it says there, um, inspections, restaurant inspections to make sure that they're washing the spoons that you're eating. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want the hep A that the last guy had or something like that because the restaurant didn't wash my spoon. So um, that's your public health at work. They, the health department coming in and doing the inspections, that's public health. Um, the USDA has a big role in public health, and they have it in such a, a novel way that I did not know was a thing until a high school friend of mine, when we got out of school and got into our career fields, she went the USDA route. They take uh, meat by the ton, and I just lost power. There we go. That's right. Um, no. Um, time out. Do we want McAllister's? Yeah, I'll do McAllister's. Yeah, so the King Club, no tomatoes, please. And that got into the class recording for the night. That's awesome. That's all right. I'll cut it out. Uh, <laughs> Y'all all know what I'm eating for dinner now. Yes, please. Um, so anyway, the USDA has a pretty cool mission that a friend of mine does. They take meat by the ton and they inject this, um, the vaccine, the um, rabies vaccine. <laughs> I have a number three. Um, they put the rabies vaccine into the meat and then they just fly out over the woods and dump it. And they let the wildlife eat it. So the raccoons will eat it and it helps keep the, the rabies down in the wildlife. So less likely you're going to get it if you get bit by somebody. That coupled with your normal uh, rabies vaccine that you get, we've gotten it down to where the, the rates for va for rabies are very, very low in our country. Um, it's a good thing, especially down here in the South where you got raccoons and possums and everybody running around and they, that's, they're the big spreaders of that. Um, yeah, so, all right, Mark, me and you got similar taste in food. And I'm, not a, I'm not a tomato guy either. we started <laughs> all right uh ems research so this helps determine the shape of ems um evidence-based medicine there's a, we actually teach evidence-based medicine and refreshers now they wanted us to start really harping on that um so evidence-based medicine basically there's a couple of agencies out there that will keep track of everything that we're doing and it doesn't like how do we know when how do you guys think it works out when um, a new protocol comes out and a new way of doing things? I'll give you a hint. We'll talk about one that's coming up now, double sequential. Has everybody heard that term before? Yeah, we used to do uh, double sequ sequential defibrillation in California. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so you got California's pretty progressive with their stuff. It hasn't been adopted by the AHA yet, but it's been around for a bit. So the way evidence-based medicine works um, in EMS research, we have these agencies out here that will they'll come up with an idea, and they'll have different departments around the country. They'll subscribe. They'll they'll like task them to do it. So double sequential is not a standard yet. 
The reason you were doing it in California is because whoever you were working for was tied into these research agencies and said, we'll try this in our area under controlled environments or at least well monitored environments. And we're going to see if it ups the success rates in our area versus the areas that are not doing it. So they're basically just doing science experiments. Um, if it, as these, as this data starts to come in and get compiled, if it does supposedly make a good increase in survivability rates in this case, um, then you're going to start to see it in things like CPR training. Um, the, the 2020 updates for BLS mentioned double sequential. It's made it that far that the AHA recognizes that people are doing it, but they're still waiting for more documentation to come through and more research to come through before they make it a standard. Maybe in 2025, we're going to see it, but um, we're not there yet. So hopefully, um, hopefully we do, because Slide L Fire Department does double sequential right now. So they're collect they're they're building data. <laughs> Why don't you tell me how you really feel, Henry? I saw that. <laughs> I think uh, isn't New Orleans EMS doing it? I I don't know. I'm sure they are. I mean, they they have their own TV show. So you want to do bougie stuff? There you go. <laughs> it's not as bougie as the uh, show makes them look. Uh, I've I've heard. I've heard. Yeah, they're not going to put anything on an episode that's like, why did you do that? Because that's a whole other show. It's true. <laughs> all right, roles and responsibilities of the EMT, and this applies to all levels. But keep your vehicle and equipment ready. Know your bag, especially if you, the AEMTs, you guys have to give more drugs. Know where your drugs are. Um, and some of those, some of those containers that hold your vials in place kind of suck at it. They're not really built that well. Um, even the nice bags like stat packs, like we, we use a stat pack for training at the, uh, Biloxi location. And every time I open up my, uh, med bag for an AEMT student to grab stuff in, the vials just fly everywhere. So be ready for that. Um, you, we open it in a controlled environment. You guys may be opening it in a hurry on the side of the road or something. So if every time you open it, glass vials are flying everywhere, you might want to take some time and figure out how you can stop that from happening. Um, Ensure your safety, right? Safety first, take care of number one. You are the most important person on the scene. If you run up like a blue canary and wind up becoming patient number two, then we got problems. Uh, be familiar with emergency vehicle operation, provide on-scene leadership, and that's more going to be the advanced EMT right. level. Uh, EMTs, you guys can be leaders if you're the top dogs on the scene, but a lot of times you're going to defer to the paramedic. Doesn't mean you're going to let the paramedic do all the work. That's not what I'm saying. But the higher level tends to be the team lead or um, when in doubt, whoever's at the patient's head is going to be in charge. And we'll talk more about that when we get into um, module two. Call for additional resources if needed. Remember that you can't do everything. Even the fire department doesn't do everything, right? We are we tend to be the Swiss Army knife that if when in doubt, call the fire department. Right. That doesn't mean we're going to solve it, but we may know who to call as well. So fire department's a good one. Police is a good one. Um, everybody's got their limits, but some of us are just knowing what agencies are meant to do, what things will help. So knowing that the fire department, our main goal is scene safety. And oh, well, now I'm curious. I saw that. I saw that hand. It was very. Um... <laughs> Y'all gonna give me crap. I'm gonna dish it back. So, um, but anyway, knowing what different agencies do, right? So you have law enforcement there, more about crowd control and that kind of safety. Uh, fire department, we're more about environmental safety, making sure that uh, an overturned car is not gonna continue to roll when we start messing with it. So we stabilize scenes in that way. Um, perform your patient assessment and give medical care while awaiting additional medical resources. That's good for all levels. Give emotional support. Sometimes that's all you can do. If you walk in and the, the 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 patient is deceased on the chair and that's why they called you, you may not be able to do anything for that patient. That's the unfortunate reality. However, you've got a family that's breaking down and having the worst day of their life around you because they just lost their grandfather or or their dad or something like that. Or even worse, it you know, what if it's a child and you're dealing with the grieving parents? Um, don't be afraid to give the emotional support. 
there's there's limits to what you can do in that range but don't just be a computer and be like that oh, sucks to be y'all we're gonna go ahead and call the coroner um that's not a good service maintain your continuity of care you're going to learn more about that in chapter three about who you can hand care off to and who you can't resolve emergency incidents uphold um medical and legal standards which is also a chapter three thing and ensure patient protection or ensure and protect patient privacy which is also a chapter three thing anything in here worth mentioning give back to the profession so um, I want to talk about that for a second. What can you do? What are some things that y'all can do to give back to your profession? We work in the field that is very passionately driven, I guess is the way you can say it, because we have not made a lot of money in this field forever, yet we still get people. And we get people because that's our calling, right? And that's, that is a BS way to explain a low wage, I admit. But um, there is some truth to it. We don't, nobody does this job if they don't really love what they're doing. They don't stay long. But that being said, what can you, what are some things that y'all can do to give back to EMS, to give back to the fire service and make it better than how you found it? I give critical feedback of things that might need help, you know, ideas. <laughs> so you walk in and y'all screwing this up. Well, not necessarily in those words, you know, <laughs> like like constructive criticism, I guess you would say. But yeah, okay, you know, all right. I, mean, I like that. It's one thing to say you're doing it wrong. That doesn't tell me anything. It's something else to say, hey, you should be doing it this way, or you know, give a possible solution. If there's no solution offered, then it's just a complaint, and that doesn't that doesn't do anything. But um, but yeah, all right. Some 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 criticism. That's good. Um, something that we've done is we built a nonprofit and the nonprofit has a couple of missions. One is that we build financial scholarships for public safety to try to get people into the field who would be fantastic providers, but maybe don't have $2,000 laying around to pay for EMT tuition or more if they're going to go higher than that. Right. Um, we also provide financial relief and, um, assistance for like sick and injured first responders that are already in the field people that get hit by a hurricane you guys down here in the south we're no stranger to big storm storms so big we give them names that come in and they wipe out everything in in our way and what are we doing on the day after the storm are we taking care of our property or are we out trying to save everybody else we're all working but who's taking care of us so that's something else that the nonprofit does and then we also try to put life-saving equipment into the uh populated areas like AED, stop the bleed kits, things of that nature. So if any, anything is needed, you know, I talked about the app earlier. Um, that's something that we're doing. So that being said, y'all don't all have to go out and create your own nonprofits. You don't have to go out and make the next, the next big thing, but you can give back to the profession by championing a cause. If it's um, you find a nonprofit that you like, you like their mission, volunteer, um, you can donate if, if finances is what they really are after and what they need to do their job, then you can donate, but things like that are great. Uh, toys for tots is another great thing. Things that you can do to help kind of make the community be a little bit better, um, gives back to the profession. And it's not just about the medical side of things. We're, we're the ones that basically keep society running and keep it from falling apart when bad things happen. And that's a pretty wide lane of things. So any of those um anything like that would be great you you can get on with us with the uh our nonprofit. you can find others there's wounded warrior project there's um what do they call it the 100 club which is over in texas um there's a lot of them out there invent a new tool i think the guy that invented the halligan tool that we all use and, and swear by that's our wonder tool was created by somebody off in colorado um and again i could be wrong on that i think i heard that somewhere um that tool is fairly new it wasn't that long ago that that tool was created and that's like <clears throat> that's a huge tool in the fire service um anyway all right so professional attributes integrity empathy self-motivation hygiene and appearance if, if somebody walks in and they look like they just crawled out of the trunk of their car i don't want them working on me 
Uh, Self-confidence. I know that a lot of times, especially early in our careers, we have a lot of imposter syndrome that kicks in, especially the first time we really see a bad call. But it's okay to not know everything. It's okay to um, need the help. But be confident in what you can do. All right. But I want to talk about integrity for a second because this is huge and this will make or break you. What is integrity in your own words? Be willing to do the right thing every time, no matter who's looking. I like that. That's the definition right there. Um, I like to say, don't be two faced. If I'm going to do something because nobody's looking at me and I can get away with it, I messed up. That's a lack of integrity, right? So the idea is that you do something because it's the right thing, not because you're trying to put on a show or something like that. Just do the right thing. If you feel the need to hide it, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Time management, um, communications, teamwork and diplomacy, uh, y'all can read. Um, the big thing on this slide that I'm gonna probably foot stomp would have to be patient advocacy. So we have a bad habit in this career field of making decisions that may or may not be in our patient's best interest. And it can come from a couple of things. It can come from complacency. It can come from being burned out. It can come from bad protocols. Um, it can come from just seeing the dark side of humanity for too long. And then you start to paint everybody like that. Like you get a, you get a cop that works investigations and he's, he's working murders, um, for half of his career. He's going to, you stay in it long enough. You're going to start to see the problems that you deal with in everybody, whether or not that's true or not. So it's important to not let that happen. Being a patient advocate means, sticking up for your patient when nobody else will so um that and that can be in a couple of ways if you take them to the hospital um and maybe there's a an issue insurance issue or something like that you can actually go to bat for your patient i'm not saying pay their bill or anything like that because god knows i don't have enough money to do that but um you know say hold on before you kick us out let's is there any kind of alternative and start pursuing it? Because the, the patient may not know what questions to ask or who to talk to. Uh, it's really big on the mental health side of things. So be that person if you can. Every patient is entitled to compassion, respect, and the best care, even if they're the drug addict or anything like that. We don't want to not treat them. Um, one of the things that really... That. I have come across what? that so much in the CNA field and even doing the, um, and you know, doing stuff in ER and stuff is they'll treat them like they're a person when they're in their face. And then everybody in the break room is talking, oh, my God, did you see that dopey? Did you see how he looked when he come in here? That is so unprofessional. If you are not yeah. in it for to help these people, then you do not need to be there. Like I said, over time, we it, we really do have to start fighting that. It's a drug, you know, I'm getting a call for a drug overdose. It must be a drug addict. That's not always the case. Or here's an example um, <clears throat> of something that we ran into early in my career. I, I don't like doing war stories, but if they apply, I'll, I'll use them. Early in my career, I spent some time as a CNA and uh, I couldn't do it. I couldn't I couldn't go to work, get attached to these people that were there and, and abandoned by their families. Be, they basically, they become my grandparents all over again, and then they'd pass away, and I'd be like losing a family member. Every time I come into work, I'd be worried that some of the people that I was working for, which were the patients, were not going to be there, that they were going to die silently in their bed, and no family was going to care, and I wasn't going to get to sit down and talk with the guy that had flown planes in World War II. Um, that was hard on me, so I got out of it. But what really broke the camel's back for me was we had a 103-year-old little guy a little, little um, African-American guy that was in his in his room, and he had some family coming to see him. And one of the things that you're taught um, in the CNA role, and I know you know this, if they want, like, we like to keep them in clean clothes. So we would like to, sometimes we have to change their clothes every day or whatever. But if the patient wants to wear yesterday's clothes and they are not soiled, they didn't do anything to them, we don't have to force that, right? So, um I was given a set of clothes by the 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 charge CNA, whatever you whatever you call her. And she said, go change Mr. John's um, clothes. He's got family coming today. 
Okay. So I walk into his room. Hey, hey sir, how's it going? And John's not his name. I'm going to say John Doe. But um, hey, sir, how's it going? We, we, uh, you got some visitors coming today, and we need to get you changed into these nice clean clothes so that you're presentable for them. And he's like, oh, I'm glad to get the company, but I'm 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 fine. I'm happy in these clothes, and there's nothing wrong with them. And I'm like, no, you look fine to me. Okay, that's that's your choice. Um, no stains, no no nothing. So I go back out. And the charge uh, lady sees me holding this clothes that she gave me. And she's like, why didn't you change his clothes? He's got people. She like flipped out, went in there. It's like she snatched the clothes out of my hand, went in there, scooped him up out of his uh, wheelchair, dropped this guy on the bed. He's at this point, he's crying. And um, she's like, he's like, I'm just repeating over and over again. I never meant to hurt nobody. I never meant to hurt nobody. And she's yanking the clothes off of him because he's got to be in the clothes that she wants him to be in. And uh, I couldn't take it. I, I left the room. I reported it. And we both left the building at the same time. I left because I resigned. She left because she was fired. And I just thought, this is not the job for me. I was already struggling with the people that had, that had died. And seeing that, I was like, nope, can't do this. I'm going to stick to the fire service where I come up, I fix you, and I leave. And that's it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a CNA. I stick up for them. I'll go up against a nurse on something like that because... Like, they have a right to fall. They have a right to wear their clothes. They have a right to have long fingernails. They have a right to drink Dr. Pepper. They have a right <laughs> to do that. We have people laying in the floor because they keep falling out their bed, but they have a right to fall, you know. So, yeah, I'll go up against a nurse on something like that. If I know it's 100% right and they're 100% wrong on something, yeah, you know. But, I mean, I, I won't do insubordination by any means on purpose or just because I feel like it. Right. But if if it's, you know, for a patient, yeah, I will do it. Well, same thing. That's why I reported her. I didn't just let it happen all the way. Uh, as soon as I realized what she was doing, I went out and got the help to get her to stop. Um, but yeah, take, you know, compassion goes a long way, even in our field. So don't, don't lose that. If you, if you catch yourself or somebody else catches you, um, starting to get to that burnout, don't let your cert go, but maybe take a break change, uh, move over to a different level of, of the medical field, go into administration, um, get, you know, get out of patient care for a little bit. Let some of that stress that you've been carrying around start to fall off and then get back to it. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, be familiar with HIPAA. That is huge because, and for example, if I have a patient, um, a patient file sitting on the table and it's 10 pages, um, it's $10,000 fine per page of patient information that gets leaked. If somebody comes in and they're doing the HIPAA inspection, they find that there every time they're going to open it up and they see 10 pages, that's $10,000. No, I'm sorry. That's a hundred thousand dollars that you were, that your, uh, agency now owes because of the HIPAA violation, but they're not going to stop there. They're going to look at it and be like, Oh, these are actually front and back. That's 20. So now I'm at two hundred thousand dollars that the agency owns, and it's it's horrible. Like the amount of money that you would have to cough up in a HIPAA violation will absolutely cost you your job. Like the, the you know you're not on the hook for it, not technically. Uh, your agency is, but um, I have heard of agencies garnishing wages and stuff like that to try to recuperate some of that money. And of course, yes, absolutely, you were fired for mishandling um, information, and the same thing goes for talking. If if I'm if I'm working with you, sir, um, and I sh I go on a call and I it's, it's whatever it is, it could be um, a broken bone. It could be, a, a, a you know, a pregnancy or whatever. And I come back and I tell you about it. That's a HIPAA violation. Um, because you weren't on the call. Right. You can only discuss things with the people that are in that chain of of care. So. I show up to the patient. The only person I can talk to, even at the ER when I'm handing it off, I can't just tell everybody in the ER what I'm dealing with. That's why they have a um, <clears throat> a single person that takes report from everybody. Or if it's multiple people, it's because the person you're giving the report to is going to be the next person to take that patient. So all that critical patient information is only right there. Uh, it makes a lot more sense when you think about the fact that you might be disclosing the fact that somebody's got gonorrhea or something like that. Nobody wants that information blasted out. So um, you have to be careful with who you talk to about it. 
All right. Any questions on chapter one? I'm not going to go over these review questions. Uh, Y'all can. But again, the, the slides are in the SharePoint to be downloaded. So by all means, use these slides because you have these questions in the back. They can kind of help you out. But um, this is it. There's 10 questions per chapter that are in the um, in the slides. Okay, well, guys, it is actually close to nine o'clock. I'm not going to start chapter two tonight, and that's okay because the uh, schedule did not combine those chapters anyway. So we're we're not behind by any means by waiting until the next day. <clears throat> um, hopefully, Chris has got his voice back, and we'll move on from there. So if y'all have no questions. Um, we're going to go ahead and start to wind it down for the night. Now, I want to make sure before we all head out that everybody's getting their tech side figured out. Is there anybody having issues with um, accessing Platinum or accessing this? Let me let me go back and look and see how many guests we have in the room. Um, I haven't been able to get in Platinum yet, but I'll figure it out, I think. OK, I'm going to work with you on it. I got to get you figured out for why you don't have chat in here and everything chat either here and everything either. So Addison Morgan, Morgan Jaffa Givens, Givens, Jos Jocelyn, Jocelyn Muniz, Muniz, Rodney and Rodney Sydney. And Sydney. Um, Y'all came in um, some other in way. Some way. Got you. I came in as regular. I came in as regular, but then my computer started tripping. And then Hold on. I had to mute everybody because of the, the feedback. Un, unmute yourself and say all that again. I came in as the regular way, but I don't know. Something was going on with my Wi-Fi, so when I logged out and logged back in, it put me as guests. Okay. Even though you came I, in through the SharePoint? Yeah, I came in through the SharePoint. I pressed the live the live um class, and it still puts me as, it put me as guests. That's interesting. Okay. Um. Somebody had mentioned it earlier and, and I didn't catch it, or at least I haven't seen it because it doesn't show it for it me. But when you come me, in, but when you come in, who unmuted? I'm a guest also. Oh, it's you. Okay. Oh, it's you. Okay. Um, um, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. All right. All right. All right. All right. So, um, when you get the teams to come up right before you come into the room, look and see if you see a login option. And then use that to make sure that you're logged into your Aries email. That may be the issue. Somebody had mentioned that earlier. All right, but um, it's not a big deal tonight. I just want to, if we need to, get with me sometime before Monday when we have the next class, and we'll do some trial and errors. I'll come into the um, into the room and have you guys log in, and we'll see if it works. If we can figure out how to get you guys in as your Aries emails. This way, you can see the chat. And also so we can get you into the breakout rooms like we're supposed to. Uh, what you got, Chad? Yes, sir. Just um, making sure the, the only thing that we have from this point on after each module, uh, the only assignments that's going to be going through that plan of ED is going to be the uh, the module assessment. Anything outside of that, you, you know, uh, uh, having a senior moment here, but as far as like everything outside of Platinum ED, um, that, that's the only thing we have to do, right? So the next 72 yeah. hours. From, oh, from tonight, yes. Yeah. So, and it's not the module, it's just the chapter one, because all we covered tonight was chapter one. Oh, that's right, chapter one, I'm sorry. Yeah, the module was <laughs> a couple of chapters, but yeah, we have 72 hours to complete that, but that's the only assignments right now. Correct. Yes, we do have some tests that we can give you as extra credit for those that wind up needing it. We can also do um, discussion questions and stuff like that, but they're not there for everybody. Like I, we are, I'm working on building some of those back as we used to have them, like a a big discussion per module. And I've got some ideas about making like a big scene. And you, as we go through the course, we keep going back to that scene and applying what you're learning and everything. But um, we haven't got that yet. So for right now. All y'all have tonight, um, you should have already read chapter one. Now we've lectured chapter one. So within 72 hours, you have to take the chapter one test and that's it. And we can get with you on tomorrow 
for the people who didn't properly log in so we can get the SharePoint documents? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'll be working with y'all. I'll be working with y'all. Is there a direct contact number or email or? You can email me. Email me. I don't even know. What is the email? <laughs> It's my first and last name at Aries. Aries. So Robert dot Roy Robert dot Roy at Aries Med Solutions. Aries Med Solutions. Okay, Robert dot Roy. Okay, yeah, yeah, we do. Okay. We've we've talked. We've got my talk. Yeah, yeah we talk. yeah, you're fine. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else? Any questions? So y'all know I because do. of the way. Okay, what you got? Um, for the platinum thing, um, am I set up in there to take the test? You should be. So everybody, okay. I, I don't know, like I've approved everybody. So nobody's, well, I take that back. I think since I started teaching tonight, one or two people got in as a, uh, they're sitting pending and I'm going to, I'm going to finish that up tonight. Um, where we are with platinum is for everybody that has signed up, um, you used one of two course IDs. We had an old one that some of the people that signed up early got, and then we shifted to the new course. And so all of your tests are set up in the new course. So those of you that used um, the right course ID, if you log into Platinum, you're going to see your tests. Everything is there. If you log into Platinum and you don't see any tests, that means you're still sitting in the old course, and that's you don't have to do anything. Platinum is going to fix it uh, when they get back to their offices tomorrow. So if you log in tonight to go take the test, you don't see it. Give it till tomorrow afternoon and you should be able to see the test. Because that, the that gives Platinum time to move you to the right course. That's course B124, correct? Yes, but I'm referring to the course ID. There's like HQs, whatever. Um, that one became uh, something that was actually almost like four out of five digits were all numbers and only one was a letter. But um, that again, that's that's all right. That was that's on us because we changed the uh, course ID late in the enrollment process. So there's nothing that y'all did wrong. Um, and we're getting it all fixed. It's just it has to be platinum uh, tech support that moves you over. So we're waiting on them, but they'll have that done tomorrow. And then I can relook at the slideshow when you get off when we exit off. Yeah, okay. you, all, the, all the slides are in the SharePoint. So go to the chapter where you were going to click the enter the lecture. If you look right. to the other side of the screen, so you have the, the live lecture, the recorded lectures, and then you have additional resources. Right. Click on the additional resources and you'll find the chapter slides. You'll also find over time we're going to upload things that we find useful. Like if there's a cool YouTube video that explains something, we may link it in there as just something additional for you to watch and kind of get some extra um extra training okay that's just how i do it I, I just do it twice or three times as extra study besides i read the chapter in my book which is of course different from y'all book but it pretty much is the same thing yeah they're all pretty pretty much the same because it's all a standard course right the textbooks the textbooks will word things differently but it's all the same information right okay all right well um i'll say this for y'all moving forward and it'll also be in the recording before i stop the recording the way that we're going to be doing the pin codes from now on is we are not going to say them in the chat because they don't know they don't apply to y'all right the reason that we're doing it this way is teams builds a roster of everybody that's live in the class but let's say you can't make it on monday that means you're not going to show up on the roster so when you watch the recording um if it's this class you're watching we're going to actually in the title of the of the lecture we're going to put the pin all right, so it's right there because sometimes we've had issues where the recording cut off before the instructor said what the pin was, and then we get flooded with people needing that pin. Um, so it's just as easy to skip to the end of a recording and listen to it, and not listen to anything else. So it really doesn't hurt us to just put it into the title. Um, that being said, for those of you, when you make a live course, you don't have to deal with the pin. There is no pin for y'all. All right. So if y'all if we got nothing else, um, I'm gonna go ahead and call it, and we can have a good night. I can eat my ice cream and McAllisters. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Absolutely. Um, have a good one, guys. Yep.
take it easy and uh, we'll see how my instructors feel. I, I should not have to teach you all on Monday, but if we do, I'll probably see you all on Monday regardless, but hopefully I'm not the one lecturing. Everybody have a blessed weekend. Peace. You too, you too Deborah. Deborah.